how cold the air can be, how he can be lost so quickly through the window of opportunity, just like a draft in the night. See how words can twist and hands can ring like phones inside empty homes when nobody's there to hear. Hi everybody, this is Richard Sachs, your host on Lost Arts Radio. It's really nice to have you back with us. This is our Sunday evening show for August 21st, 2016. And um, super show, in my opinion, you know, as, as usual, with because of our guests. The uh, first one is the return of Barry Troer, who uh, has been with us several other times. You might want to hear the archives of him by going back and looking on uh, Blog Talk or on our site on lostartsradio.com. I don't remember the dates offhand, but it's really easy to find, and that's on several other media as well. And he's a microwave weapons expert on a world-class level, worked for the UK government um, in microwave weapons warfare, and then eventually changed over to working on behalf of all of uh, the population because he saw the utilization of microwave weapons technologies in everyday household communications technologies and others, most notably cell phones, smart meters, uh, Wi-Fi of all kinds, all applications, and other other um, gadgets and, and uh, products that you have that require Wi-Fi. Initially, it was just you know that you had a, a choice. You could take your laptop and either plug it into the Ethernet or cable or you could have it on Wi-Fi, but now more and more smartphones and tablets and other things are being made so that you can't plug them in and you have to be on Wi-Fi. So there's a, a plausible justification for having Wi-Fi all over the entire world because after all, you don't want anybody, you know, any poor individuals to be left out of access to the internet, which by the way is being handed over to the un major criminal organization called the United Nations uh, shortly. I don't really see how they can do that, but that's being done. Obama's going to carry it out if there's no way found to stop him. And um, so anyway, we're, we're just being flooded with all these gadgets that are involved in the necessity of Wi-Fi for them to work. And so obviously then we need Wi-Fi all over the entire world to facilitate that. And Barry Troer is one of the um, highest level of knowledge voices talking about why that's not such a good idea. He lives out far, you know, in the country, in the UK. We talk to him on his landline because he doesn't even have a cell phone or a computer. He really does live and believe what he talks about. But, they're, you know, the uh, government in partnership with the global corporations, which is the structure that is in charge of things now, they're rolling out this new network called 5G and talking about how wonderful it's going to be for all of us because we're going to get all these fantastic benefits from it. And in fact, I want to ask Barry about that too because, um, oh, I, I didn't really mention the, the reason Barry's coming back today or tonight is because he said he wants to come back on the air when we get enough questions uh, emailed in from our listeners, and we've got more than enough now, and they're still coming in. So he said he wanted to come back on the air with us on Lost Arts Radio and start answering questions because he, he just considers it his mission now to help spread awareness of the whole problem with Wi-Fi. And just like there are people totally devoted to stopping GMOs or chemtrails or nuclear power, or war, other things like that, uh, this is Barry's focus on microwave technologies. So he, it's an incredible um, good fortune to have him on the air and to have access to him, even be able to contact him is amazing in my opinion. So we want to talk to him about implications for the world future uh, by the you know spreading and intensifying microwave technology everywhere and um, 
talk about the uh, the qualities of these new technologies, what they do to people, what they do to the rest of nature, um, you know what what's happening in the effect in the population and in in the rulers who are bringing these about, and what we could possibly do to, if anything, to stop this uh, trend toward uh, what they call the Internet of Things, and I guess that's how they're identifying the 5G rollout, is that that's what they're saying it will be, and it's going to be just so wonderful because uh, eventually you won't even have to pay any attention to the outside world at all, as uh, Zuckerberg has demonstrated with uh, numerous meetings where he's had these people wearing helmets that cut you off from external reality and all you can see is your electronic input. And, of course, when that gets better and, and more smoother operating, uh, you won't even need to wear a helmet. You'll just have electrodes that connect to your brain or implanted chips where, you know, you can control elements of your outside world by just thinking about them. And, of course, there will be the little problem that you won't be able to tell the difference between the outside world or something happening virtually in your brain. But the idea is you won't care. And you will become uh, totally happy with your life and totally controlled, uh, much like in the movie The Matrix, but a little bit beyond that even. So this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I just wanted to mention that um, the people in Congress in the U.S. have actually been attempting to stop the handover of the Internet control, specifically domain name control, which apparently is very important. Doug probably knows more about that than I do. But um, the Congress has been stopping, trying to stop the president from handing it over unilaterally to the United Nations because the United Nations can be controlled by a majority of totalitarian uh, dictators, which, of course, the United Nations may soon, uh, sorry, the United States may soon uh, totally join in that group as one of them. But uh, more in the chi- in the style of the Chinese internet censorship, and this would be one way to accomplish it without getting any uh, required laws passed by Congress. Just hand it over for free to the dictators that are already running that way, and then you don't have to discuss it with the public or anything really irritating, like you know, involving Congress. You can just do it, and you can hand it over to them with your pen and your phone, and that's how. Obama has started operating with most things now. So it's pretty amazing, and that's scheduled to happen, I believe, in October. Interestingly enough, and probably not by coincidence, that's right before the uh, election in November. So um, pretty exciting times. I've been reading articles from many sources about these being the last few months of relative internet freedom, even though censorship has already been tightening up considerably. But it could go to a whole new level once it gets uh, subjected to a vote of the people that control the United Nations. So we're going to see what happens. If, If we get cut off at this point from uncensored access to the internet, it's going to change almost every aspect of life. So if there's any way that we could avoid that happening and look for ways to get less insane people, less malicious people in control, that would be good. And Barry's not typically telling us answers to how to stop the movement towards, um, you know, the Internet of everything and and Wi-Fi controlling all of our lives. But he gives the information. And then in the second segment of our show, we're going to look at at least a clue to some possible solutions of that one part of the problem. And I'll tell you about that after we talk to Barry. So let's go uh, do some Q&A with Barry Troyer right now. Appreciate this is a really rare opportunity. And uh, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from him. And I'll talk to you after that. Welcome, everybody. This is Richard Sachs, your host on Lost Arts Radio. And we're incredibly fortunate to be here uh, virtually in Barry Troyer's UK residence with him. Dr. Barry Troer, and we get our chance to have our follow-up to the last show that, that Dr. Troer did with us. When uh, he left, you might remember that he asked us if we could get some questions together from our listeners, which is you, that uh, he would enjoy answering them. 
uh, for us. And I'm sure this hour is going to go by in, you know, two minutes trying to get in as many of these questions as we can. But it's a, it's a rare opportunity, so let's see what we can do. I'm going to start with uh, some, and welcome, Dr. Tror. I'm going to use the time as well as I can. Thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate it. And um, it, it, It's my pleasure, sir. Let, let's have the questions. Okay, so we'll start the questions here. That, well, first, we've got a couple of uh, kind of long text ones, and then we have a bunch of short ones. Okay. So the, the first of the uh, long format it says, it's a little letter for you, uh, a person that says, Hello, uh, Dr. Tror, I admire your courage and respect your intelligence. I do, however, have a question about holding a cell phone by the plastic. As I'm sure you know, microwave radiation p- passes right through plastic with virtually no attenuation. I spent 25 years working in a microwave lab, and now at age 82, still have no adverse signs, and early on when knowledge was primitive, we were very careless, and until Hewlett and Packard began making thermistor-powered meters, often had to use a lot of creativity in measuring the output power. Our first power meters consisted of a wad of steel wool in a glass jar. The intensity of the glow gave the indication. It wasn't until the early 60s that reliable but not very accurate methodologies were developed. The calorimeter was considered the ultimate in accuracy until my dismissal for whistleblowing in 86. You were a fine and knowledgeable speaker and have a synergistic knowledge of physiology. As I'm also sure you are aware, microwaves can not only be reflected, they can also be traduced into heat. I designed stacked systems for many applications, including aircraft electronic countermeasures. Regenerative oscillations, this is the only long one, I'm sorry. Regenerative oscillations can be a real problem in high-gain systems, especially where gain is high over about 50 dB. So all leakage, no matter how low, can ring around. I've been able to prevent even the slightest leakage by transduction, not reflection, ecosorb, or a stylistic material embedded in non carbon iron shavings works well. There are ways to stop microwaves, not just reflect them. Interested in your statement about microwaves being used to trigger bombs, prior to my financial martyrdom in 86, I was thinking about design of an airborne remote mine location and detonation system. My whistleblowing and resultant blacklisting put an end to that. So I guess there's not a question. He's just sharing some experience. And if you have a comment, then we'll go on to the next one. Um, the, the, the very first piece, I, I believe he said um, that the microwaves go through plastic, which of course is true. And may I compliment the gentleman, please? Um, he's slightly older than me, and I hope when I reach his age, I, ha- I have his intelligence uh, and integrity. Um, he is absolutely correct. And could, could everybody just please call me Barry? Um, sure. uh, can we keep this informal? Um, sure. The gentleman is absolutely correct. Uh, and uh, as the gentleman pointed out, that uh, holding a cell phone uh, by the plastic, uh, of course, is no protection. And as the gentleman suggested, it, it is not the microwaves uh, as well being transmitted out, but they are also transmitted th- into you through your brain but as the gentleman indicated as well that it is also uh, which people don't realize uh, there is an uh, an electric field coming from the battery uh, so you, you can actually pick up a field which can cause harm from the battery, which also comes through the plastic. And the gentleman is absolutely correct, and everything he has said is, is correct. Um, and, of course, there, there are no safe levels of microwaves. But he did say that he was not affected, <clears throat> and that is the problem. Um, and this is a very, very good point to raise, is that um, we know that around 40% of any population will be unaffected by microwaves, the the same as 40% will be unaffected by smoking. Uh, So, but but, um, I I compliment the gentleman, uh, and 
uh, for his knowledge, uh, and I, I, I sincerely hope that I can live up to his standard when I reach his age. I think he'll enjoy hearing that from you. Um, here's a real short one. Uh, which university? Oh, this is about you're just asking if we would call you Barry, which is great for me. I, please, I like yes, I like please, first please. I like first names. This person wants to know since a, a lot of people do refer to you as Doctor Troer. Can you share with us what your uh, PhD dissertation was in and from what university? Right. Um, my, uh, I, I do not use the word doctor. I, I know I have been made doctor uh, in some countries. I suspect it is not legal in this country, uh, which is why I never, ever use it. I've never, ever... Uh, as you will know, sir, I've never described myself as an expert, and I have never described myself as a doctor, and I do not answer to the word doctor. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are overseas awards, which may or may not be legal, I don't know. Okay. Um, um, and as for my universities, both of my, uh, and I, I published this in my thalidomide report, both my universities have disowned me. And that is not uncommon. I don't know about the United States. It is not uncommon in this country. But both my universities have disowned me. And when I challenged uh, one of them, they, they said, your, your work is too political. Okay. And basically, in this country, the universities, not all of them, but, but the ones which I research with, the universities depend heavily on the government because the government sets the university fees paid by the students. And also, even more importantly, the government are the biggest spenders for... Uh, military research <clears throat> and universities sadly are um, dependent upon the government really for their existence and it, it isn't I but but um, a, a gentleman a minister a minister for science several years ago had a, a, a paper published in the Times um, where he said that uh, honest science now was uh, just really dependent upon which university you could go to because uh, they were now dependent more on money than the truth, which is a very, very sad state of affairs uh, right. when universities are afraid to tell the truth uh, rather than... Uh, depend on their income. Um, so what we have, uh, and I've experienced this with both my universities, each has said, never ever contact us again, do not walk <laughs> onto our campus, yeah. um, and do not refer to us. Um, so, I, I mean, although I have two university degrees, one a higher degree and a diploma, um, technically you could argue that I have been disowned uh, so uh, there really is no answer for that sure. uh, because we're in the sad state of affairs where not just I but, but people similar to me and more clever than me um, have been absolutely disowned by their universities and have everything stripped away because they prefer to take money from the government than tell the truth and it is, I think, and, and it should be a short answer, but it's a very good question. It is a very, very slippery slope when you prefer to take money from a government and government scientists and government agencies rather than tell the truth. Because sooner or later, there is going to be no truth. There is only going to be universities putting out what the governments want them to. Uh, and that is a very good question. So <laughs> in answer to that question, um, technically in this country, probably my degrees, I, I don't know, but legally could be totally worthless. Right, right. It, it's, a, it's, an it's a subject that we could talk many hours on just that question. 
And uh, the same thing is happening certainly all over the U.S. and very much in, in my field of focus, which is the health sciences area. Um, doctors are not only stripped of their medical licenses, in our country they're actually killed. If they tell oh, the truth. Oh yes, yes, absolutely. Um, when uh, and uh, again, answering this 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 person's question, and I'm sorry, I I, I didn't catch the name, but um, when I was uh, invited to a, uh, make an address at the Welsh Assembly Parliament Building, the, uh, and and this is on the internet, my address to the Welsh Assembly Stroke Parliament, uh, the first thing I did was pay tribute. I think it was to eight leading research scientists who had all suddenly committed suicide. Yeah, yeah, that one of them, that the first one in the last wave that committed suicide in the U.S. Uh, did it very creatively. He shot himself twice in the chest, and then he ran over and jumped in a river. Oh, absolutely, sir. Uh, and one, I was asked to intervene in a legal case uh, abroad in Europe, where um, a, a research scientist who developed something uh, about the spy networks with the communications industry, not only did he hang himself, but he managed to make all of his documents disappear at the same time. Right, right. Some of these people are so <laughs> creative in how they commit suicide. It's mm. amazing. Um, okay, so, um, and when we have an extra 10 hours, we can continue on that subject. <laughs> oh, so. we, we, we're not short of time. We, we, we will have more conversations, so I promise I, you that. I hope, I hope so, Barry, because uh, there's a lot that we need to get into. And, and you know, let me just make a 30-second comment here about what you said. People have been conditioned to de decide what you know by what degree you have and where it's from. And what they've been, you know, successfully brainwashed to forget is that it's the intelligence, creativity, experience, and observational ability of the person that determines the value of the knowledge they come out with, not what university, medical school, or government agency certifies them. And it's oh, just absolutely, sir. requires a little bit more you know, clarity on the part of the observer to tell who has legitimate information. And unfortunately, it's not as easy as just looking at their degree. So, but I, I but totally agree, sir. Right. Uh, there are many, many um, government agencies who give qualifications to people and then make those people. Uh, national experts uh, and they are the only people that you can go to if you require advice uh, um, and they are not experts they are just government uh, advisors yeah but you can make a lot of money telling people that uh, you know radiation is safe and other things like that um, here here's another uh, quick question why do some microwaves go right through our bodies unimpeded while others take refuge within ourselves and grow in volume and eventually make us ill? Uh, that is to do with the, the cyclotronic and the circadian resonant frequencies. Um, uh, every part of your body is vibrating, every single part. Right. You have cyclotronic resonant frequencies in all of the cells, uh, mainly sodium, chlorine, calcium, potassium, and you also have uh, circadian resident frequencies, which are clocks, uh, and there are quite a few of those in the body. Um, they, they are really miniature clocks um, powered by the body, and they turn off and on different hormones, antibodies, um, bodily systems. <clears throat> now, um, to interact with, with the cyclotronic or circadian resonant frequencies, and that is a brilliant question. Whoever sent that in, well done, because already it has been discovered very recently that uh, ladies have 13 different uh, circadian resident frequencies than men, <laughs> which means that you can have microwaves going through a house, uh, 
and either the male or the female can be saying, I've got this metallic taste in my mouth, or I'm hearing this annoying noise, or this, I, I've got the t most terrible migraine, or, or, or something is going wrong with my, my heart, or, or my brain is not working properly. Um, and everybody else in the house can be saying, well, we're not picking it up, for goodness sake, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Go and see a doctor. Uh, whereas, in fact, they are picking it up because different resonant frequencies or different microwaves will affect different people of different ages and different sizes. Um, your, your lungs have their own resonant frequency as long as the cells, your heart, a child's heart will have a different resonant frequency than an adult. Um, de it depends, put it very simply, it depends if the organ or the cell is a multiple, a mathematical multiple of the microwave going through. If it isn't, then it will probably go straight through. If it grows, then it will become a multiple and it will then resonate with either the cyclotronic or circadian resonant frequencies. And there are uh, four and a half thousand different uh, biological processes in the body that can be subject to these uh, microwave frequencies. And as you grow uh, and change, they will switch on and off. So it, it isn't, um, will you get this? It, it is a question of which day will you get this? Which month will you get this? And then they switch on. So it, it is variable. Uh, it is an immensely complex biochemical uh, and mathematical structure. But sometimes they will go through and sometimes they will affect you. And sometimes they will affect up to 600 different parts of your body in a single go. Uh, and, and sometimes it may only be one. Uh, and of course, they all have a knock-on effect with each other. So it, it isn't a straightforward question. And this is one of the problems we have with testing people for microwave sickness. Um, you, you may not be receptive to it on that particular day, but if you went a week later, it, it could make you violently ill. Hmm. Wow. And, and some of the resonance questions you're talking about that determine whether or not a person is affected are very similar to a discussion about music and chords and harmonies and thing, disharmonies, things like that. Oh, absolutely correct. And, and um, with, with microwave weapons and these um, earth weapons, I mean, in, in theoretically, whether they're doing or not, or I, I don't know, but with harp uh, and the other harp apparatuses, um, they will go into sort of the fifth harmonic or the sixth harmonic. Um, they set up harmonics, which, of course, can be set up in your house, in your body. Um, with harp, theoretically, you can set up uh, to change jet streams, you can produce earthquakes, mm -hmm. uh, right. you can do all sorts by, by setting up, usually it's the fifth harmonic going through the planet. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you can have harmonics build up in your body. Um, it, it's just like musical harmonics, it's, it's virtually the same. So, um Here's a, a kind of a philosophical question in a way, it says, or, but it's actually practical as well. He says, I'm a victim of state-sponsored covert harassment. Ask Dr. Troer if people targeted individuals that are living the nightmare of microwave weapon attacks like myself will ever get justice or, I guess, relief. <clears throat> um, it, it, it is, uh, and to be honest, there are hundreds of thousands of people in this person's situation. Will you get justice? Uh, it, it, it depends. It is immensely complex <clears throat> um, because it, it's usually followed with gang stalking and all, all other sorts of uh, interruptions to your body. Um, could you get justice? Yes, but... Um, 
justice is in, in the UK. Um, they they say justice is like the doors of the Dorchester, which is one of the most expensive hotels in the city of London, um, open to everybody. Uh, but only people with immense wealth can go through those doors. Right. But, but the, the justice is open to everybody, but unless you have immense wealth uh, at your fingertips, the chances are uh, nobody will believe you. The more you try and convince people, the more they will send you to psychiatrists mm -hmm. and or you will end up in a psychiatric institution and with injections going in your arm. Um, it is immensely complex. <clears throat> you have to prove that you are being targeted. Then you have to prove who is doing it. Uh, and it may not be the country that you are in that is doing it. It may be other people in your country using you as a target. Um, you have to be able to prove, you know, with scientific instruments, like a full range electromagnetic spectrometer, where it is coming from. Uh, and these things, you know, they can cost sort of $2,000 a day for somebody to operate. Um, can you get justice? Yes. In reality, could you do it? Uh, probably not. Uh, and I'm not being defeatist here. Um, uh, and where do you go? May I? Um, there was a, a particularly brilliant, and I'm going to suggest a magazine here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to suggest a magazine, uh, and, and I can assure you they do not pay me and nothing comes back my way. But there was a 30-page article published in, in a recent magazine, well, going back a couple of years, um, and it, it, the, the author uh, it was particularly good, and he covered every particular type of um, abuse from government on ordinary people and where the research is, how you can do it and what you can do about it. And um, it, it was much more clever than I could ever have written. Incredibly well researched and it is possible if you get through to this magazine, rather like Scientific American in that, it is possible to get hold of them and I know this because I suggested it to somebody not long ago and I think they charged them a, a couple of dollars a couple of your dollars mm -hmm. to uh, put it in the post to them uh, and I would recommend you get that can I say the magazine yeah please do yeah and the magazine it's it's sold in the United States it's a worldwide science magazine it's called Nexus Mm -hmm. N-E-X-U-S. Okay. It is <clears throat> the June-July issue. It's bi-monthly. Um, the year 2014, it is a 30-page article, and it is called Mind Control. And if you go on the Internet for Nexus, June-July uh, 2014, uh, and go on to the mind control article, um, they will charge you a couple of dollars to, uh, for you to download it. Okay. Um, okay. And that, sounds great. that, I think, is, is the most comprehensive article. And there are lots of people there, specialists in each of the 30 or so different types of uh, physical abuse and mental abuse uh, that you can contact. Great. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent resource. People can get a hold of that. Um, here's another question from a listener who heard you talking about the police van that was being impacted by Tetra. And he says, um, how did the Tetra microwaves breach what I assume was an extremely solid metal van? Because he heard you say that metal will block microwaves. 
No, they, they didn't block it. No, what, what happened was, um, and this was published um, in a scientific journal. I, I, I wrote an article uh, which was published. Uh, and if the gentleman is in the police and he contacts me, um, I, I'll happily send him a copy. Um, no, what, the, the, what I said was, <clears throat> was that the driver of the van said something like 12 police officers got in the back and this was this was during the london g20 riots mm -hmm. um they the officers got in the back with their tetrasets transmitting and he said when the officers got in mm -hmm. they were ordinary police officers who got in they drove to an area where the riots were taking place, but they were inside the police van, and because they were transmitting, the microwaves were bouncing around inside the van, turning it into, effectively, a microwave oven. Got it. Okay. So they were actually microwaving themselves, and the driver made a statement which said that whilst they were in the van, they were becoming more aggressive. They knew they were going to go out aggressive. They were getting more and more angry, which is a, a phenomena of the tetra uh, wavelength, the, the pulse frequency. Mm -hmm. They were taking their identification numbers off their shoulders so they couldn't be identified. Wow. And he said, we were listening to the rioters coming closer over a period of a couple of hours whilst they were in there microwaving themselves. And eventually, when the rioters were near, the back of the doors of the van opened and the dozen or so officers jumped out with their batons. We don't carry guns. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the officers beat somebody to death. Uh, and in fact, it was just an innocent bystander who, oh. who was nothing to do with the riots. He, he was just trying to shelter uh, and he beat him to death. <clears throat> um, and so the microwaves weren't coming through the van. They were being reflected within the van. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's why you don't, you know, put metal all around your house on all sides of it and then have some kind of transmitter on the inside because the same thing could happen. Oh, absolutely, sir. Absolutely. And, and if the gentleman is in, in the police force and asks his union um, to write to me, I, I will send them a copy of the confidential document. Okay, that's great. Here's a short question asking about the difference. <laughs> I, I love short questions. They, they yeah. always take the longest answers. I know, I know, I know. Sorry, I, I know. No, that's okay. We'll, we'll carry on. Go on. There, there's no way we're going to get through all these, but as many as we can. So um, this one is asking about the difference between the standard cell towers that you can recognize up in around towns and in schools and everything, and what they're now in the U.S. calling antennas, which are much smaller but they're listed as sources of cell connection and things like that. Um, how can you tell the difference? You can't. Um, uh, and I will tell you now that um, uh, you, you have trees which are now cell towers. You have advertisement signs which are cell towers. You have crosses on the top of churches which are cell towers. Oh. Um, and you also have miniature cell towers or miniature transmitters which <coughs> excuse me, which which may look like um, burglar alarms or any other thing stuck to a wall, a fuse box. You also have, uh, and this is probably still top secret, but I don't care. They can send me to jail if they like. You, you also have uh, metallic sprays that you can spray onto plants, onto the side of buildings, which will also now, using nanotechnology, pick up transmissions and redirect them. Uh, and they can also use everybody's, if they are wired correctly, and a lot of them are these days, they can use every single person's <coughs> cell phone as a receiver transmitter for anybody else other than you. 
So if you're saying how can we recognize one from the other, you cannot because you wouldn't know the difference between a transmitter and receiver and a fuse box and a Coca-Cola sign. And I'm not saying Coca-Cola are using them. I don't know. I'm using that as an example Mm -hmm. or a Big Mac sign or anything else sign. Um, They are disguised inside these, sometimes without the person's knowledge. Um, It is very common now for churches to use their crosses. Uh, because of the money that is involved. Yeah. Uh, they... So, can you tell the difference? No, and you would probably walk past 99 out of 100 transmitters and not even know they are transmitters. So, so it sounds like these are also in the process, as a technology, they're in the process of gradual miniaturization. Oh, uh, they, they've got down to nano type particles now. Okay. They, they've got down to nanotransmitters, which can be sprayed onto a surface. Right, right. So what you said that the cell phones that everybody's carrying around, many of them in contact with their bodies, can be used as essentially relay stations for uh, radiation coming from cell towers. What hap- if that's the case, what happens when you turn your telephone off? Does that help at all or not? Oh, no, no, they're designed to work when you've turned it off. Okay. Um, And in fact, if I can expand on this, um, you turn them off, uh, and a lot of people listening will will actually appreciate this. Um, You you turn it off to save the battery, uh, and and then within a few days, you know, the, the battery is totally flat. And what you don't realize is that they can be remotely turned on. Uh-huh. Um, and you can be used as a relay station for n- not numbers of people, but, but anybody, the secret services, the government, a- anybody. Um, and it can, or can, or can also be used by industry. Um, for it, for it, I, I know I was talking to, and I won't mention their name, I was asked to talk to a, a conference room full of bankers, um, and I said, and, and they all had their cell phones off, uh, sitting on the table. And I said, do you realize that not only can they be turned on remotely by a, a, a competitive bank where they are listening to what you're talking about to do with shares or whatever, but um, in the spy networks, if you have one of these cameras in your cell phone, um, they can also activate the camera and they can see who you're talking to. They can pick up everything, you know, every conversation. They can watch who you're talking to and you think your cell phone is off. So, in other words, you can't look at it and, and see whether it's turned on or off by whether it's lit up or not. Oh, no. No, absolutely not. Uh, and if, if, if you are... Um, on the suspect list, um, they will have not only your cell phone operating to pick up everything you say, but they will have your uh, voice identification for everybody you talk to. So if you're talking to somebody, the voice identification will go through and they will identify that person. They will pick up the face and that will go through the same face identification that they use in Las Vegas to pick up faces going into casinos. Um, uh, They will know who you're talking to, uh, what you're saying. It can be recorded. uh, And all of the time, uh, and this can be to do with security networks, spy networks, industry networks, um, uh, and all of the time you think whatever you're doing or saying is safe. Um, and, and, uh, and in fact, it's being listened to. And it's not just that. Organized crime have this technology. And it is known and published that they are using this to blackmail people. You know, you could be ordinary um, John Doe going around. You could be married. <clears throat> Excuse me, please. You could be married. Um, your cell phone could be off in your pocket, um, and you could be visiting a person 
uh, with whom this person was satisfying some particular need that you have that, that you wouldn't like spread over the front pages of your Sunday papers and <laughs> to your dismay uh, several weeks later organized crime can come to you with photographs and sound bites and everything else and tracking devices and say look you can buy this off of us for one thousand dollars or it goes to the local paper um, which would you prefer and and this is actually happening uh, and it's been warned against uh, and there are a lot of people being blackmailed wow. uh, and it is a very very lucrative side for organized crime so if you're going to sleep or in a private meeting or anything that you don't want spied on you can't turn your phone off. You've got to put it somewhere physically a certain distance away from you, right? Uh, well, what I say to people is, <clears throat> if you really don't want people to know what you're doing, um, go to a, 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 a toy shop or an academic shop, um, pick up a school child's geometry set, that they tend to come in a tin, a little tin box where you have a compass, a protractor, um, things like that. They tend to come in little tin boxes or just buy a, a little tin of biscuits. Eat the biscuits and keep the tin. <laughs> Put your cell phone in the tin and then this can't happen. If you just put it in your pocket, um, they will know everywhere you are. Even if they can't hear you and can't see you, um, you can be tracked, you can be re remotely tracked once they've got your cell phone number, and, and that's not as difficult as it sounds, you can be remotely tracked, and if you are visiting, let me just say a pole dancing club, or a place of similar repute, um, or a friend who is offering you services uh, that you cannot get at home, um, then you can be tracked um, and you can be blackmailed. And that is an incredibly protective, uh, not protective, um, uh, an incredibly uh, progressive market by organized crime. Right. Uh, and, and I don't just mean mafia. I, I mean organized crime from the Indonesian countries, the Mexican countries, uh, English country, you know, England, the UK, uh, organized crime. Um, it, it is an incredibly progressive uh, way of making money. <clears throat> uh, and what they do is they just contact you and say, look, give us, depending on your wealth, and they will already have had access to your, your bank account, um, you will give us this, or we will publish this. Uh, you know, do you want to lose your marriage and your job, or your university degree, mm -hmm. or give us this, and we'll give you all the copies? Um, you know, it's so easy. Yeah, I mean, just imagine, based on what you've said, if our, if our governments themselves ever became not pristinely honorable, what they might be able to do with this as well. Well, you're, um, it, it, it's, been, it, it's been on the, dis, the, the Discovery Channel that your um, FBI and CIA say, say that these, um, is it Facebook and MySpace and those, mm -hmm. um, uh, they are their biggest friends. <laughs> because right. Right. everybody photographs all of their friends um, <laughs> uh, and you have sound bites and pictures um, and if you think that the CIA uh, and your secret organizations of any country cannot penetrate Facebook, Facebook and, and these others, um, you, you really are quite naive. Right. Um, and once, once you're up there, you could be in, in almost every country's documentation files in the world. Right. Uh, so basically by funding social media like Facebook, CIA has bought itself a tremendous free staff of uh, spies worldwide, and they've also come up with uh, 
a, a, a really wonderful system of spatial surveillance that they're getting in real time constantly for free with thousands and millions of agents. And it's now called, I think, Pokemon Go. Well, all, all of these, and, and I mean, and then, uh, I'm going to run over time with you because um, <laughs> I, I want to say this, um, and I may have said it before, but for any of the younger listeners listening to this, um, I always say to them uh, when I'm speaking, for goodness sake, don't put anything on social media that you would not want on the front page of your local Sunday newspaper for all of your grown-ups to read. Yes. Because one day, uh, and I've spent 11 years talking to spies, uh, and I know how they work, or one day when you have a nice secure job and you are a family person, somebody is going to knock at your door and say, I have this document that says you had sex under the age of consent. You smoked pot, which is illegal. You did this, you did that. It may not come to have any harm, but did you put it on your application for university? Did you put it on your application for your professional career? Did you put it on your application when you wanted to become a teacher? You know, now we have you. Uh, and I say to them, you know, fine, if you want to talk to your friends, talk to them, but do not put anything on there that you do not want on the front page of any local newspaper and you do not want your parents to read. Right, right. Yeah, very good advice. And, and as far as the whole world of video games is another subject too because now those are two-way mirrors and everybody's being watched through their television sets and their video consoles. And this I don't know if you know in detail about this new game where millions of people are actually playing it, they put fake monsters for you to catch out in the real world. And you take your cell phone and it tells you when you're playing this game where the monster is and where you have to go. And they've actually had people walking off cliffs and into traffic and everything just trying to get those. And they, they're turning in real-time live streaming data to government agencies while they're playing the game. So, okay. okay, here we go, and I'm, I'm condensing the questions as much as I can so we can get through more of them. Um, somebody wanted to know about the ability of the towers that exist now, the cell towers around town, so they're being proliferated so quickly, even where there's no lack of cell service, they're putting in more and more and more, and they're wondering what's involved in using those on command as weapons. Um, I'm sorry, could you just repeat the last part of that question? Yeah, what's involved in using the existing cell towers as weapons against the population? Um, there is a document uh, which uh, just happened to come my way, which is um, virtually top secret. <clears throat> um, and that is a very, very, very good question. Um, what is happening now is that um, they are putting different types of transmitters on these towers, and, and well done that person for asking this question. And uh, the latest thing that they're doing, uh, which really comes to the, the nub of this question, is that uh, they now have the right wavelength coming out of these uh, for the scientific people here is 75 to 110 gigahertz and uh, it, it's in the microwave band and this is really going to horrify some people <clears throat> the reason they are putting this on all of these towers in, in throughout the UK and the United States um, they are saying it is to identify weapons being carried 
by people. So if there is a riot or a demonstration or you suspect people are going uh, along the road, you can use the tower to body scan the person and it will pick up a weapon and see how many people are carrying weapons and where are they. But the other thing it can also do, uh, which they are not telling you, is that um, it basically it makes you look as if you are naked and uh, it will go through your clothing, but it will show in, in very high definition the outline of your body. Now, with with somebody like me, it, it, at my age, in my 70s, um, if they want to look at the outline of my body, fine, you know, if that's, if that's what they want to do, uh, good luck to them. But if I were a 16-year-old girl, uh, I, I might think differently. Um, and this is also a, an open door for paedophiles and uh, similar people um, because every system can be hacked into. So if you have a countrywide system, and I mean, this is only days old. Um, so in fact, you are getting, I think, what nobody else in the United States actually knows yet. You, you are the first. Um, if you have a system which actually allows people to walk around virtually naked, well, naked, not virtually naked, um, with the pretense that you can pick out weapons, um, where else is it going? Uh, I mean, my, my imagination can't actually fathom this yet. Um, so really, you're looking at people walking around in high definition, totally naked, but you, you will see guns and knives and, and anything else that they are carrying uh, underneath the clothing. Um, and it's one of the things that's also being used at airports and military bases and, and whatever. Um, it's already been used at airports, but it's, it's now being improved. Um, but uh, the one that I saw uh, at an airport, uh, and I'm going to be very delicate in what I say here, um, with airports you sort of spread eagle yourself in front of a, a, a plain board, but it, it is abs in high definition, you can make out um, the, the total genital area of male or female. Uh, there is no nothing discreet there. And now this is being adapted to all your cell towers and it, it will give uh, the people watching, and I, I don't know who has the license to watch this, um, it will give them permission to look at anyone as if they were not wearing clothes for the sole purpose of defining whether or not they were carrying a weapon. Um, and if you imagine this now in the hands of disreputable people or paedophiles, uh, and they were taking prints and printing them off. I, I, I don't know. Um, but any system, every single system can be abused. Um, you only have to say, I will pick out 1,000 uh, respectable government officials. Um, how many of those are likely to be uh, tempted by looking at naked women or men or children or whatever, um, how many of them would be tempted to print them off? Uh, and the answer cannot be zero. You know, it, it's the human race. Right. Right. Uh, so, uh, and that person has asked a question that I've only found out since yesterday, um, uh, and it just happened to come my way. Uh, but but this is now, in answering that person's question, um, they are developing the ability to see you totally naked under the pretense of seeing if you are carrying weapons. Right. Okay, so, so basically they're turning the entire outdoor environment into an airport checkpoint. But, and, and indoor, and, and indoor. 
and 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 indoor and indoors and and so mm-hmm. the other part of this question and I, I have to make it brief so I can get to the other one I wanted to ask you mm-hmm. is that um, they do have the surveillance ability through existing cell towers but do they also if they wanted it have the ability to generate physically harmful frequencies as a weapon oh yes of course they can absolutely uh, any transmitter can be done done used for that any transmitter okay. um any transmitter uh, uh as i said it, it may be a fuse box on a wall it may be like an old piece of cable wrapped in pipe just hanging out the wall anything they can all be used to generate harm every single one okay the the question that i i wanted to get to here was um there's a there's a person that that um, had an experience of dreaming at night and being told that if they didn't stop questioning certain things that were government programs that were harmful to the population that something very bad would happen and this was clearly said in a dream and they were told in the dream that this was being transmitted by a person on the outside and shortly mm-hmm. after that, the person got in a serious car accident. So how is, how is that actually done to transmit a clear voice into someone's dream? We're going back to the very first question about um, circadian and cyclotronic resonant frequencies. Um, they penetrate the, the, the part of the brain known as the insula, uh, which will formulate or develop into hallucinations or dreams and it is easy well, easy it, it is possible to program the insula and the part of the brain to uh, uh, dream a particular sequence or have hallucinations in a particular sequence um, it's been known since the 60s that, that this was capable and could be done but it is not difficult for anybody who can push a button uh, to uh, <clears throat> um, penetrate the, the not just the insula, there are other parts of the brain w- which are used, but that is the main one. Um, you, you, you penetrate that part of the brain and you can really develop any form of hallucination or dream and you can make it so lifelike that it is also possible to make a a person wake up and want to commit a crime or murder somebody or do some harm somehow right right and if if the person who was dreaming felt that this particular instance was where the message was being typed on a keyboard and it came out in audible words in the brain. Is this something within what you just said? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's called synthetic telepathy. Um, it, it's, it, it, I mean, that is incredibly easy. Uh, you, you send a similar frequency to the cochlea in, in the ears, mm-hmm. uh, um, you, you send a, a, a signal to the cochlea, w- which picks up the electronic signal. You are the only one who physically hears the sound, um, and you can combine that with the messages to the insula, <clears throat> and um, you deliver verbally any particular message you want harmful or from a god or somebody mm-hmm. telling you to do something and the insula can give you the dreams or the hallucinations um it, it, it's been known since the 60s okay so so this is a way to commit crimes without having them traced back to the actual person who is responsible oh uh, absolutely yes yeah uh, I, I could do it to you right okay if, if i if i wanted to i could do it to you yeah yeah Okay, but there's just way more than we're going to get to here, but another person is asking, what is the minimum safe distance from smart meters, and are they line of sight? Um, Again, um, there is another paper which came out just a a, a couple of days ago, 
um, where in, in fact the major electricity and power generating boards of the world um, have actually said that <laughs> smart meters are not needed and the document I have here um, and this is published uh, I think yesterday smart meters not needed after all for European power grid um, smart meters are actually not needed um, there are other devices that I won't go into now that can do the job of smart meters without having to have them um, and smart meters the danger area uh, according to a document just published a couple of days ago, you see how up to date we are here, is um, you need to be further than 600 meters from a smart meter. Now, a lot of people will have the devices inside their houses stuck to a wall. Right. Um, but you need to be a, around 600 meters because of the um, Wi-Fi pulse frequency that they are enabled to do or which they give out. Right. And even if you don't consciously feel the effect, it doesn't mean that they're not biologically harmful, correct? They are biologically harmful. Uh, there is no way a smart meter can be safe. Absolutely no way. You may not feel the effect, but it will be affecting you somehow. Do you? Do, um, are, it, it, it may not be giving you cancer or an abortion, uh, not an abortion, uh, a miscarriage or uh -huh. stillbirth or breast cancer or whatever, um, but it will be affecting you somehow. It may be more colds, more coughs, longer colds, longer coughs, usually depression, certainly suicidal de um, tendencies. <clears throat> um, it will be affecting you. There is not a single smart meter which is safe in the world uh, and if the company want to use some of their billions taking me to court for saying this I am saying it you are not responsible I am and they are welcome to take me to court any single day they like because I will stand my ground right. well, the frequency used by smart meters is a known practiced and published weapons frequency and it is known to cause harm okay so with that situation and and of course you know it's nice of you to say i have no responsibility but it's my fault that you're on our show <coughs> and, and we'll be back as frequently as possible so um what i want to know is what you know if if anything about the rollout of the new much more intense 5g system which is being announced now to intend to cover the, the planet. What, what is that about and what's that intending to do? Um, there's a document. <laughs> I, I, I say one thing for you. Uh, you are really on the ball. Um, a, a document, again, published over the last couple of days. Um, I, I, I do tend to have these just drop through my letterbox anonymously. Um, uh, to be honest, uh, and again, a brilliant question, there is not a single person on the planet, myself included, that can tell you the harm that 5G can cause. It is so complex, it is so mathematically unknown, that nobody knows they've put all this together and nobody actually knows at the moment because they don't know the waveforms uh, they do not know how it is going to interact with the body any other life form on the planet nobody knows what it is going to do they could switch it on and it could cause instant death for all we know mm -hmm. um, they have put it together, they have said this is 5G, it is the best thing since sliced bread, we are now going to market this and we are going to get it out, but there is not a single person on the planet that can tell you it is safe, there is not a single person on the planet that can tell you how it is going to interact 
with all of the four and a half thousand different biological structures in the body because at the moment they don't know what it is <clears throat> and if I can give you an analogy it would be like you sir going into your local pharmacy taking a dozen bottles off the shelf of something that you have no idea what they are or what they do mixing them together putting them in a breakfast cereal publishing the breakfast cereal as a new wonder breakfast cereal and give it to it to everybody and saying i have no idea what is in this i have no idea of the effect it's going to make on your body but i want you to buy it that is 5g mm -hmm. sounds encouraging so <laughs> the the future is definitely on you know boy there's so many things i want to say at once but i'll just say this one thing what's going to come up as one of the most important fields for all of us to try to make some contribution is and in is going to be countermeasures to these things if any such thing is possible well you're right i mean at the moment um you 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 have the most powerful people in the united states pushing this out the same as this country and many other countries not only do you have the most powerful people, but the most powerful organizations, all the secret services um, and everybody that backs them. Yes. Along with the most powerful industries on the planet. Um, they are pushing it out. But it, like other things, it will not be until enough people have died and enough people have suffered, and I'm talking genocide numbers here. Mm -hmm. It is not until we have another genocide that people say, hang on, enough is enough. And this is what they are hanging on for, because at the moment they are developing a new light system with LEDs whereby they do not use microwaves and then by the time when enough people have died they will say well we've got a new system which is harmless um, if you think the old system has killed you uh, we've made a thousand billion dollars out of this we are going to fight our case try and take us to court and some people like anti-smoking will be successful they may get a few billion paid back over several million people over several tens of years but the people making the money will have made their thousands of billions they will be on their yachts and, and in their big houses and successful and they will be working on their new system uh, and that is the way it is going to work. That, that makes total sense, Al although I, I would have to say in response, too, that I've learned to totally trust our government, and I don't think that they would come out with a new system like that unless it was even more harmful than the last one. Oh, you're, 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 you're probably correct, sir. Um, I, I don't know anything. I know that with, with the people in, in our government, and I spent 11 years in investigating them in the Cold War, um, if you offer uh, certain people in this country um, a knighthood and getting their children into Eton and Oxford and Cambridge and a big house, uh, they will do anything for the government provided they stay secure and it really doesn't matter how many people die. Right, right. Well, listen, um, we've kept you over your time limit and I, I really appreciate it. I, I really hope that you'll, in spite of your impossible schedule, try to come back <laughs> yeah. a, as often as possible because I, I think... This kind of uh, awareness and information, we need to keep up with it uh, as well as we can. Can I ask, how many more questions, roughly, do you have? How many questions that we did not get to? Yeah. Probably only about 20 major ones. 
can we book if could you ring me next week and could we try i'd like to make a promise to every single person who took the trouble to listen and took the trouble to write in mm-hmm. i would like to make a promise that we will answer every single person's question I if like you that. could ring me next week yeah. uh, uh, and maybe we could do two one-hour sessions, uh, you know, uh, two weeks running, uh, sure. and we can get through ten questions in each hour. Uh, I would like to guarantee, as a promise, every single person, we will not abandon them, and I will promise to answer their questions. That would and be wonderful. If you would ring me uh, next week. Uh, we will sort of book another time and then another time after that and we will promise to get through their questions. Yeah, people will really appreciate that as well. It's my pleasure, sir. Uh, And and I promise to answer their questions. I'll call you next week and good luck with all the work. Please do, sir. Please do. And and thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. We'll talk to you then. Okay, so there goes Barry Troer. That was a really incredible session. And uh, it's an unexpected surprise that he wants to come back again and finish the list. And I'm sure the list will be too long for him to finish at that point because there will be more questions. And then he'll get to come back again. And uh, it seems like more people than just me enjoy having him on because we get a lot of requests for that and uh, a lot of listens to the archives when he's involved. I was going to try to send emails to all the groups against smart meters and EMF but that he's going to be on you know, tonight, but I didn't get a chance to do that. So hopefully they'll find out about it and hear the archives. I did want to make a, a comment on the credentials issue that came up because it's a big deal and it's very very uh, relevant and, and meaningful. And you remember that one of the first questions that I read to Barry was a guy that says, okay, where's this guy's doctorate from? What did he write his thesis on? Apparently, um, whoever asked the question probably searched for it and couldn't find it and immediately thought, you know, I'm just guessing, I don't know, but might have thought that Barry was a fraud trying to pose as a doctor, but that wasn't the case. He, You know, sometimes when people do great work, they get awarded honorary doctorates from reputable universities, but as Barry said, once he switched over to telling the truth to the public, well, forget it, the universities just disowned him. That was his words. And it, it illustrates a point that credentials can be really good or the opposite. And what determines that, to a large extent, is the issuing agency. So, you know, for example, I've been involved in PhD programs in the university in America lately, and they're teaching things that, in health sciences anyway, that are simply false and misleading and tend to support the drug industry, which is not a health industry in reality. And they're teaching people racism even in the middle of health science. I mean, they're just they're becoming mouthpieces of a a criminal government and criminal global corporations. So credentials from programs like that, which actually I'm going to be piled down with myself, they don't indicate that you know very much valuable. Now, they, they might, because if you learn a lot of really usable stuff in engineering or the part of medicine that allows you to repair people like Doug needed when you're in an accident or something, that's really good. But if they teach you things about health, like preventive medicine is getting 500 vaccines or a mammogram, both of which are deadly dangerous and damage you and don't help you. If, if they teach things that are false, you know, like to um, cure you from an infectious disease, you need to flood your body with antibiotics, which means anti-life and kills everything. Or they teach you that compassion... Uh, for poor women is showing them easier ways to get abortions uh, rather than adopting the baby. And, you know, there's so many ways that what you're taught now that's acceptable in mainstream and you get credentials for being an expert in repeating it are not necessarily what they appear to be. And I think we need to remember that. Barry Troer is a, a great person to have around as a resource, not because of, of credentials, 
not I mean not because of degrees, you know, that kind of credentials. The real credentials that matter are what he's done, what he's learned, what he's figured out, and what he's experienced. And that's true for you as well and me. If we have 12 PhDs and we survived it and we're not totally brainwashed, we could still be a good resource and still have our common sense intact. But a lot of people who go through the programming of that process of so-called education lose their common sense, lose their ability to think. Uh, they get blinders because if they look beyond a certain limit of knowledge, it threatens their identity. And all this money and time, which I totally understand that they put into getting that education, and if they allow themselves to realize anything that um, threatens that, then they have to start questioning whether they were intelligent to go through all of it. And that's too much for most people. So um, you see credentials being used as an actual weapon to suppress real information uh, in law and medicine and education and science and biotech, energy, agriculture, public health, C psychology, like people who are being trained to be CPS managers and things. You get credentials of these people and they end up using them in, in really negative ways. And some of the best paying jobs now are working for destructive aspects of the power structure supported by these credentials to keep people in line and make sure they don't think outside the box or ever realize that they're serving absolute destruction. So you have to be really wise and discerning when you evaluate someone's credentials and consider what they're doing. You know, it's, it's kind of like knowing a tree by its fruit. And, and the other thing is negative credentials, like somebody's past if they've made a lot of mistakes or I know great people that have worked for the power structure and done massive destruction before, but they finally realized what they were doing and changed and are doing wonderful service now. And they deserve total support and appreciation. You know, it's like the old thing of letting whoever has no sin throw the first stone, right? It's like, you know, that's how humans learn, is making mistakes. And then they figure out, you know, eventually, in this lifetime or some other time, they, they find out what the mistake was, and they change. So we need to appreciate people like that, which is pretty much everybody at some point. Anyway... We went through all that with Barry and a lot of pretty heavy-duty information about what's going on and what's developing with 5G and all the rest of it. So I thought it would be a nice balance to look for somebody somewhere that's working on a local level that's actually making some progress in blocking the proliferation of the cell network. And I found a little group like that. It's only a handful of people. And they're in Southern California. They're a group called Keep Baldy Wild, B-A-L-D-Y, because I think they're centered around Mount Baldy, which is a beautiful place outside Los Angeles. And you know Los Angeles used to be a spectacular nature retreat. People were sent there to get over respiratory problems and stuff because the air was so good. The smell of uh, orange blossoms was everywhere with all the orchards. It was just beautiful between the ocean and the mountains. So it's changed a little bit, but, you know, there's a lot of beauty around Baldy, and they're trying not to have it all totally destroyed by EMF pollution. And this group is amazing. Just a few people I met, they're, they're, you know, they're not professionally polished radio presenters or anything. They're just like, you know, any of us. And they said, we can't let this go on. And for the last four or five years at their own expense, not supported by any organizations. They have been uh, doing everything they can for the benefit of people who mostly don't even realize that they're doing something great. So I wanted to give them the floor and let them talk about their project. Um, I think they've done great work. And even though it's not fully, you know, uh, evident how it's going to go at this point, it's still on in progress. Um, Stephen, Allison, and Katie of Keep Baldy Wild Project. I'm, I'm just using their first names for a, just a little remnant of privacy for them because they have to deal with all kinds of adverse, you know, people who are not necessarily supportive of what they're doing. 
so also oh listen uh it was brought up by a couple of our friends listeners that I tend to interrupt people a lot, and I'm sorry about that. I don't mean to do it. I, I want to make sure that everything is clear for people that may not be following, so sometimes I go back and interrupt and try to clarify a point, but I'm really trying in appreciation of, of that uh, constructive criticism to let people finish their train of thought, so let me know how I'm doing on that. Um, so this next se- session is about segment is about a handful of brave people that stood up against a multi-billion dollar global corporation called Verizon, but is rep- not just Verizon, it's representative of the whole telecommunication telecommun- uh, industry and the, all the other industries that are working for money and power uh, to sacrifice our well-being, uh, which they apparently are happy to do. So let's go talk to uh, Stephen... Katie and Allison, and after that, I've got some important things to go over with you and maybe a couple of summing up points about this unusual discussion we're about to have. So pay close attention. This is what regular people can do, and they agree that there's much more uh, within our grasp as well. I'll talk to you after that. So welcome, everybody. This is Richard Sachs. I'm back, your host on Lost Arts Radio, broadcasting worldwide, and we just finished our Discussion with Dr. Barry Troer from the UK, although he just wants to be called Barry, so we'll call him Barry Troer. And um, the note that we left on, left off on, I guess, with with the end of the discussion with Barry, is was kind of a uh, a gloomy prognosis for the future with all these really bad things happening. And of course, the whole EMF and Wi-Fi phenomenon is just one of many parallel threats to humanity and the biosphere coming from basically the same origins. But it's a really important one, and it's about to be ramped up quite a bit if the power structure gets gets its uh, wishes for the 5G network and more cell towers everywhere and blimps helping out fill in the gaps and things like that. Um, So I really wanted to talk to someone that is working on practical, viable solutions that other people could follow as an example. And I found people who volunteered to share their experience with us in Southern California with actually trying to prevent the installation of a cell tower. And even though this is only a single cell tower, it's extremely uh, symbolic because if that can go forward and have a chance to actually succeed then there are, right this minute, thousands of people waiting to follow the example. So, to tell us about what they're doing, we have, and their organization, their website if they want to, and anything else, is uh, we're going to use their first names for a little bit of security uh, on their part, and that's Stephen, Allison, and Katie, and welcome to all of you, and thank you extremely for your time. Um, We're really grateful for what you're doing and trying to make things better in your area as a uh, point that other people can follow. So, welcome to the show. Thank you. We're glad to have this opportunity to speak with the public. Yeah, you are. So, um, whichever one of you, we have Stephen, Allison, and Katie, and whichever one of you wants to just give an introduction to people who have no idea what you're doing, where it came from, why the project even came up, who thought of it and how it developed to, you know, closer to where it is now, and then we'll get into what's going on currently. Okay, <clears throat> this is Allison. Um, how it started was um, a resident of our community put an article in our local newsletter um, speaking about the concerns she had for our community health-wise from, um, from just a number of things, but um, particularly uh, radiation and the possibility of it affecting us. And there were a couple of people that were interested enough that came to a town hall meeting and spoke. Um, Stephen was one of them, I was another one, Tamara was one, and there was one other, two others. Okay. And we kind of looked around the room at each other and went, well, those are our allies. We better find out who they are. And so we are introduced ourselves to each other, and that was the beginning of our group. Just to add a little background, uh, uh, Allison and I were aware uh, via an article in New Yorker magazine in the early or mid-'80s uh, that 
talked about the danger of uh, power lines near uh, near residences, and so mm, okay. we realized that there was a, uh, a cell tower going up. The original location that they had picked was probably I don't know seventy five feet away from somebody's window. We wow. said, "Wait a second, this is probably not a good idea." And so that started. That motivated us to go, you know, at least me to go to this meeting. Okay, okay. And so when the meeting was called ab- about that subject? No, it was a town hall meeting, and it's open to anybody mm-hmm. in the community. And so we went individually to um, voice our concerns. So okay. this was an, there was no group at this point or anything. It was just speaking to the community. Now, we also have a number of different homeowners associations up here, and I also went to my homeowner association and spoke there, and some other people did similar things. Um, but, but that was how we discovered each other. So this is one of those meetings where if you want to come, you can write your name down and get three minutes to talk about whatever you want. Oh, it's not that organized. This is a very, very tiny community. Okay. And this is the closest thing we have to a governing body. All right. So what happened at the meeting? Well, at the meeting, different, different people spoke, but for the most part, it was five of us that had not planned on, you know, on anything in particular other than to voice our concerns. And right. we just looked around the room at each other and and introduced ourselves to each other after the meeting. And that's, at that point, we thought, you know, let's get together and talk. I mean, we didn't think of ourselves as a group yet. So if you could look back at what you said at the meeting, voicing your concerns, basically what did you tell everybody? Well, I told them that I had been, and my career had been as an educator, and that I had particular concerns about the children in our school up here. We have a tiny school, and that the radiation from the self-proposed cell phone tower was going to reach those students and anybody else that was particularly vulnerable in the community. So that was the gist of my um, presentation. I think Tamara was more speaking of... She was hers was more technical and kind of at that time above my head. Um, Stephen, you want to speak to what you were saying? Uh, well, I, I'm really recalling the first this first speech that I made was at the uh, at the board meeting at the homeowner association meeting, and I I told them basically what I told you about the my concern uh, for power lines and that I thought this is that they proposed tower uh, at the at the post office at that point uh, was way too close to somebody's window and it was just the center of town or be ugly we can't even put it outside of town you know so that's how that that's how I felt at the moment was was there inadequate uh, coverage for cell phones at the time is that why they were saying they needed the tower well there was there was uh, the cell tower uh, basically uh, had been proposed some time ago because there was no coverage in te- there's no cell coverage in town at the time uh, and so everybody wanted it there was no indication at that time that there was any danger from cell towers and and so everybody was kind of in favor of it okay. but then they, by the time they got around to putting it in which was many years later they're not the, putting it in but, a, but an the actual proposal yeah. was many years later it was six years later six years later they were Eight. proposing putting mm-hmm. it in by that time uh, you, you know we had an idea there might be some danger and also where it was right in the paper. center of town or, you know mm-hmm. next to mm-hmm. the windows and, and uh, so that drew red flags up you know so and then uh, but as it turned out people uh, just put, uh, um, or what do they call those things where you put in Extended. your extenders, you know, in their home phone system. So now basically you can make a, f- a phone call from anywhere in the village without having a cell tower. So that was one of our arguments, actually. We don't need a cell tower. Right. Although it's not, it's not complete. Like, it's no. not complete, but I, I got I like, I, it's, I got about 98%. I went in front of almost everybody's house in our little village. And you could, from most homes, you could make a call, like 98% or something. Okay. So, yeah, so anyway, uh, 
anyway, there's a lot of a huge number of arguments that we made, and some of them stuck. Well, they yeah. increased as the years passed. Yeah. And just speaking for myself, Richard, I was just present at that first town hall meeting, and I just noticed Allison and Stephen and Tamara and our, our, another um, early member named David, but I didn't talk with them afterwards or join with them at first. Okay. And then shortly, at a certain time period later, Verizon held a meeting with the ta town residents, and I attended that, and then I started to take much more notice of Allison and Tamara and Stephen um, voicing what I was concerned about, and eventually I, the group formed, and I, I joined the group a while after that. What was the Verizon meeting about? How did they run that? I'm kind of curious. I haven't really known about those meetings. Well, how that happened is um, we went to the town hall, which is our tiny governing body, and requested that we be able to make a presentation to the community and that uh, Verizon representatives, we requested that they be present to present too, so that there would be, you know, it's so that the community would have their concerns addressed. Mm -hmm. And um, it was pretty amazing that we were able to make that happen. Moreover, we contacted Dr. Martin Blank from Columbia University and asked him if he would do a presentation at that meeting. And so that's what happened. It's Verizon presented, or not Verizon itself, but their representatives mm -hmm. and Dr. Martin Blank. Their representatives were, were the engineering firm that they hired. Verizon didn't let their faces be shown ever, really. We have never seen anybody but somebody that Verizon had outside of their firm. So when we asked, they were supposed to be able to answer all our questions at this meeting, and they dodged them like crazy. I mean, <laughs> they were very specific questions. Yeah. Uh, anyway. uh, yeah. So Verizon made a terrible presentation. Martin Blank made a good one. And... Uh, uh, so anyway, it's and furthermore, we tried to include as many stakeholders as possible. So we contacted the local police departments, fire departments, search and rescue, any group that might have had an interest or a concern. And because we had Martin Blank speaking, somebody from Columbia University, actually, I think it was a crowd draw. You need the community involved yeah. at least to know what's happening. They'll take different sides on the argument, but you need to get them involved in the issue. Right, right, so. right. Yeah, having a recognizable name would really help. So uh, could you tell what were the financial incentives that might have been involved in the various people that wanted the tower there? Oh, financial? No, that wasn't their incentive. Well, if oh, not yeah. at the... At the, the first tower that was being proposed, on the on, and there were some financial incentives for for people up here that wanted it. Uh, oh, for I can people only up, think of one. I, I'm thinking of the people that have it installed yeah. on their property. Wait, yeah. let's go back to the question. That's okay. what I'm. That's what I meant. Yeah, because usually they'll they'll offer to to pay an ongoing amount of money to somebody oh, to the, let it be put in there. Right, the well, family, the family well, who owned the property with the post office. Yeah. Verizon made the assumption that the fire department was on county land and they could easily put it there without objection. However, that land belongs to the Homeowners Association and the Homeowners Association did not okay it. They took a vote and um, it wasn't passed. So then, they just, then Verizon decided to get private property and so the property owner had an incentive to have that on their property. Yeah, the financial incentive. Oh. And they may have had other incentives also, but they were definitely would be paid a monthly fee for the cell tower on their property. Yeah, anybody where it's installed, they get a, a fair amount of money. We didn't, uh, Do we know how much it was? We asked, no. and we were never told. We were never told. But it was a, it's a significant amount of money. It matters to people. And... Uh, 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 it, it, here's an odd thing that turned out, I, I think, it would, tell me, um, basically it looked like even though the tower has not been installed, we've oh, no. been able to... We don't know that, though. We, oh, yeah, no, they're, not they're there. heading me off on yeah, the idea that, uh, <laughs> that a, they're getting paid yeah, anyway. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, 
it's always a winding road where we think we find discover one piece of information and then later much more is filled in that maybe there was already other arrangements beforehand or so it's been a huge learning curve this whole journey of the of more than 4 years at this point yeah wow. so what were the stages that you went through during the 4 years i'm i'm assuming these initial meetings were early in that period and then other things happened after that they were very early and so after that we gathered um, every Monday as a group and strategized who we could make contact with to try to um, partly information, partly allies to um, persuade Verizon to place this tower in a safer location and and it, it, we're still continuing that. I mean, all we ever asked of Verizon was that we could meet with them and choose a safer location. Mm-hmm. Um, and so <clears throat> every week we came up with, you know, somebody or some group or organization or government entity that we could contact, and that's what we just did for four years. And brainstormed. <clears throat> and, we, and we each were very self-motivated, and so, uh, you know, everybody would take, you know, a job on, and we would convene the next week and share the outcomes. And we continued to follow these lines of inquiry until we thought we had reached a dead end. And oftentimes, months or years later, we would circle back to them and take them up again. Okay. So you were finding feasible places that Verizon... Was it Verizon that was trying to put the tower in? I I never actually asked you. Yes, it was Verizon. But also our local fire department wanted the cell tower. Was and that was that because our, they had our become? Local volunt- oh, sorry, what? Was that because they had become convinced that it would be better for emergency calls or something like that? Yes, and and there there was a quite a you know it became a very polarized situation in our community unnecessarily, and and it may have been you know that was one of our biggest challenges because we wanted to work together with everybody. We weren't trying to shut the fire department down. We just wanted a safer location. And um, there was a lot of, a lot happened around that. That's a long story. Yeah, well, I mean, we have time for at least some of it. I'd like to know if you really had the motivation to keep everybody working on it together because everyone had the same real interests at the base of it. Why is it that that kind of a harmonic approach could not happen and people wanted to be so much in adversarial starting? things? What about starting with the meeting with the fire department? You two were there. Our meeting with oh, the yeah. fire department? Yeah, we, we met with the fire department. Yeah, we went to their meeting. To say, to say okay. that, you know, initially we, were, we didn't like the health effects of radiation, but we realized that we were not going to be able to stop it because of that, both because of the law the way it was, or you can't stop a cell tower right now for health reasons. You'd have to take that to the Supreme Court level to get that changed. Mm-hmm. But uh, but we wanted to put it in a safer location, and we wanted to uh, coordinate with them on it, and we, we, had a, we had a location we thought was safer, and actually they had done some research and thought that it was a good location anyway. Originally, yeah. So, uh, uh, so it seemed like we should be able to work together. And, and in fact, you know, we found out later there's people, diff- people on the fire department felt differently about our presentation, but they wound up kind of sticking together and just objecting to it. How, how well, would you categorize What I would say at this point is, there's so when you're working with a, a local group of concerned residents in a situation such as we were, it, there were several paths we were taking at once and were essential, and you could call them learning curves. But if we hadn't of, and another activist friend in an, in another you know about an hour away that I knew um, was advising us as well because he had been a a community activist and environmental causes for decades. And he said we really should file a PRR, public records request. And he said initially Freedom of Information Act, and in hindsight we realized we should have 
follow the procedure for Freedom of Information Act because PRRs and the public records requests provide sometimes a more limited amount of information. And this was with the county because the county was involved with Verizon and Verizon was involved and the county were all involved with our the local fire department as well. And I know everybody's, it's not to question anybody's intentions or integrity or anything like that, but it was very hard for our group when we were speaking very sincerely to all these entities and we were getting mixed messages back. And then when we did file the public records request, we found that they were having discussions unbeknownst to us. And that really helped us later um, when it came to going to county hearings and things like that. Early, early in the uh, in the process, uh, one of our other members, Tamara, and I went to all of the supervisors' offices, and we were able to speak directly to our own supervisor and uh, one other supervisor. Then most supervisors, however, had to speak to their chief of staff. But we were able to give complete, organized information. I mean, we had like a 75-page pamphlet that we reviewed in front of them with all the, all the dangers of radiation, all of our points of view. And in the end, you know, we thought that this was doing good, but basically what happened was our, our representative said, uh, look, she said, Verizon's got too much money in it, and uh, uh, we're not going to go against Verizon. So all that knowledge, we educated them. She said that we educated them better than anybody else, but all that knowledge did no good or seemingly did no good uh, because Verizon had was spending lots of money with the county on a regular basis. And how are they going to how are they going to go against it? So, well, well, it wasn't just spending money though. They there's there are a lot of agendas, and and this was another learning curve for us. You know what the agenda is, and what maybe what the ideal of local and federal government is about. But sometimes the ideal isn't quite how it comes through, um, and that's what happened for us because. We frankly didn't really feel that our representative was representing us, and 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 this isn't to lay blame, but it's a real. We certain point we had to be very practical and realistic to try to uncover what was actually going on and what our options were and what would be the best approach. And like Allison was saying, that was something that kept changing. We'd, you know, we'd go on a biology standpoint, and then we'd say, oh, you can't do that because. There's certain local and federal local ordinances and federal laws that really sort of you know hold you back and and don't you can't go that route. So we'd circle around and then later we'd find, oh well, California Environmental Quality Act actually is something that we can go with. But so it's it's just been a real circuitous route. What what are what are the ones of those the options like the biological one you talked about that people should not waste their time on and what's the what's the actual reason behind that when it it seems like common sense and you said you found out it's not practical to pursue. Well, every situation would be unique. I, I think I'll turn that to Allison. Well, what we feel is that. Every group is going to have their own specific um, situation that is going to differ from ours. But because we live in a national forest, we started questioning if there were any of our um, animals or bugs or anything. The that, habitat. Yeah, yeah in, in our natural habitat or um, native plants that would be endangered by this. And so we started pursuing that. Also, Native Native peoples lived in this area and... Historically. Historically, and the tribes are still in existence and feel a close connection to this area. And that was not addressed at all by any of the county's um, research on this, which we felt was negligent. Mm -hmm. um, but our feeling was because a group beginning if they were as, you know, unschooled as we were, which I think would probably be common, that you pretty much have to pursue everything because you don't know. Mm -hmm. And then as you reach out to professionals, 
um, then you find out what might have some teeth in it. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you just have to do the groundwork. I don't think there's any way around it. Most Mm -hmm. groups uh, don't have any funding, so they can't suddenly be hiring biologists at the beginning of it. So that came much later for us when we started raising funds to pay for expert witnesses. Um, But by that time, we were pretty sure what the law supported and what it didn't because we'd done our homework. When you did your homework, you know, talking about the state law, for example, what about the county charter? Are there potential clues in there of what they are and are not allowed to do since you're not in a municipality? And that's an excellent suggestion is to start there and, and get the county documents and, and what's allowed and what isn't. Mm-hmm. The county codes are very interesting. We were asked early in, in our interviews, uh, well, is it, is it breaking any county codes? And I said, well, I, I said that at the time, I said, I doubt if they're breaking any county codes because why would they present a tower? Why would Verizon want a tower and break a code? Okay. You know, but, but it turns out that they, they were... And uh, we didn't find out till later, and it was kind of cool. They didn't, they didn't get a, a heads up on this that we are that we that they were violating a code. And then late in the in the day, when uh, when they realized that when we brought it up at, at a, a hearing at a county hearing, when we brought it up, they were breaking this code. Between that and the next hearing, they changed the code. <laughs> so, so, so you got to be aware that they can do that too. I mean, they are aligned. It's amazing, but but the power of a group. I mean, they had a very hot shot guy come in. We had well, he had a big ego anyway. We were all afraid of this guy. There, it was a guy that worked for him that they pay high dollars to the, for trouble problem groups like right. ours. He was a troubleshooter. Yeah. He was you, a you mean he, he worked for Verizon or for the county? That's right. He, he was, was a, a hired gun. He was yeah. a hired gun by Verizon. <laughs> Okay. But it turns out he wasn't all that hot. <laughs> well, yeah, he, he, was, he was pretty slick. He was pretty there. slick, but he made his own errors. Yeah. So, and uh, the group mind, having a group of people that think together and all these different ideas, you can, you can have a lot of power. Well, that gets back to talking about the hired gun is doing your public record yeah. request because then we, and, and we had to really lean on them. Yeah. By law, they were supposed to give us this information, but we had to fight for it. But at any rate, in the public records request, we got all of the um, emails back and forth. So then you see the goings on behind the scenes, which was very helpful. Hmm. Very helpful. And, and it really, I only got, not from the public records request, but the, from the Informa- Freedom of Information Act is where we got those really substantial, or did we get some of the emails from the PRs? Well, we got, we got them PR. from both, but it would have gone more, we w- it would have gone some layers deeper if we had done the Freedom of Information Act. We only found that out towards the end. But we still got enough. It's just the county didn't make it easy for us. And um, you know, although there were some people in the county, I mean, our feelings about different personalities changed over time, too, as we became we started to understand through the, free, the public records request what positions different people were in. So one particular official that at first we thought was sort of, you know, our nemesis, later we realized that he was actually a pretty honorable person in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, the public records requests are essential for any activist group working with any government entity and also especially as Allison was saying, that um, seeing the interaction between the county and Verizon was very helpful for us to, and with our local fire department, um, just to see what was going on, because as I said, or we all said, that there's, there were mixed messages coming to us otherwise. So, so when they have discussions within the county or between the county and a private company like Verizon, are they supposed to have all of those recorded permanently so they could potentially be accessed that way? Well, they were emails, but a number of times there were some people that had a little more savvy or, or more thinking about it, but I don't, think, I don't think they really thought we would um, request a PRR. So they were, having, they were exchanging all these emails, but periodically you'd see certain personalities would say, I'd like to meet with you at this time. They obviously didn't want okay. information to be disclosed right. in the email. Right, many times they would say, you know, yeah. I'm going to phone you. 
And so then we don't have a record of that. Right. All we have the record of is that they didn't want it recorded. Yeah. Okay. Also, there's a problem at the federal level that happens all the time where they say, okay, we'll give you all the records, and you get the records, and they're all scratched out. It's called redacted, uh, yeah. redacted well, right? Rather than do that, they stonewalled us. They were supposed yeah. to give us the documents within 30 days, which they could have done, you know, like the next day. But um, the first time around, they stonewalled us for three months, three hoping months. that they could just be nasty to us and embarrass us and that we wouldn't continue to pursue it. Okay. Because we are really nice people, you know, nicey <laughs> nice. I mean, you know, <laughs> we did pretty we, easy to count. We struggled with ourselves all at oh, many junctures along the way because we didn't want to be, uh, um, what's the word? Pushy. For pushy one with anybody or even, you know, we didn't want to be confrontational. confrontational. We wanted to work as a team with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so they but, probably um, understood that as complete weakness, I would suspect. Exactly. And, and also... You, it's important to see that we were dealing with deadlines. There were county hearings coming up. That, and each time we thought, especially in the beginning, we thought each hearing the matter would be decided. And at first it was with the planning commission, and then it moved to the supervisors. But um, even so we, so we were trying to get all this information together and prepare for we, we, other members of the community and ourselves would speak at these hearings. So we needed to do our presentations, we needed information, and the hearings were coming up. So they were, it was a real juggling act the whole time. And that, and this expands for years of, because sometimes the hearings were delayed or postponed for different reasons. And, and the um, other thing is most people live in communities where they're near the hearings. We're an hour away, and we're trying uh, to uh. get community members to take time off from work to come present, to have enough of a showing at the hearing that it looks like this is important to the community, and yet they would endlessly postpone hearings where we would have to show up with all of these people and have nothing happen. Oh, man. So you just about had a full-time organizer job trying to coordinate all those logistics of everything, it sounds like. Correct. I think I was averaging the time today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's an incredible amount of time. You have to have a resilient uh, group of people. There's going to be a core group of people that work really hard on it, and then hopefully uh, some a lot of support from the community yeah. in, in right. a short period of time. Yeah. Right. Okay, so how did... Well, first of all, my question was, you said they, they took three months to give you some of these records that they are supposed to legally give you within 30 days. Is that right? Correct. Is there any penalty for not doing it in 30 days, or is that just supposed to be theoretical? Each of these things, I think, you could pursue, but who's got time? Yeah. And again, we didn't want to be confrontational. You know, we didn't want to be labeled as some sort of a, you know, um, we wanted to, we, we, we were constantly wanting to say, hey, We'll work with all anybody and everybody. Uh-huh. So we were we were always you know, writing we, that line, like yeah. We were trying not to polarize. Yeah. the situation. We didn't want to polarize things any more than they already were. So and it, there was at the point where it got on our local internet news letter, board, yeah. and it got a little bit heavy duty, and you know, in terms of the people taking sides and people getting angry. So. We decided not to do that at all, not to pub- speak publicly at all anymore, and we did all of our communication on a one-to-one basis. We would knock, knock on doors and speak to people individually. So if they had objections, you could address them in a nice way and, mm-hmm. and sort of keep calm in the community. If it gets on a bulletin board, you know, then it's Yeah, and that's nasty. probably our number one yes. advice is work one-on-one. On one. You have, it just People have no idea the power of doing one at a time. When when you had one on one and the objections that you got to what you were doing, what kind of objections came up? Well, some people actually bought into the safety thing. That's usually how these cell phone towers are shoved down the public's throat. Is on this the safety issue, and mm-hmm. and we had done enough research that we knew this was bogus. That the location was not going to do that. Uh, as a matter of fact. Verizon admitted, well, through their subcontractors, that the, that the location at the fire station would not reach outside the village. 
Well, that sort of takes care of the safety issue for the surrounding mountains. It wasn't going to reach For the highway getting there, for hikers yeah. getting lost. There was no know. way. So for search and rescue, that wouldn't help so, them much if it only covered the village. So this was easier to address on an individual basis. Right. Once right. again, each, each cell tower installation will be fought probably on a different basis. Yeah. Uh, until it comes to uh, the health issue, which is a, which people, uh, you got to have a lot of money to fight that, or a lawyer that has plenty of money. Right. So, so the, so the safety, the okay. safe, the safety disagreement was the main point of contention with the other residents of the area. Is that accurate? Well, that was an important one because we live in a tiny community. Um, our fire, our volunteer fire department is held in high esteem we want them to have what they need mm -hmm. to help protect us um, we want to be as supportive as possible and that's universally felt yes. Yes. even in our group we want to support yes. I go and contribute money to the fire department you know right right yeah. right, right we need that yeah so but people just oh, felt that. some of the people felt like you were just being um, conspiracy theorists or unreasonable because you thought it was dangerous and there really wasn't a problem well, there's two health issues that we're talking here. There's the health issue of, of being able to rescue people that need a phone. And then there's the health issue of the issue of whether the cell phones are, are bad for your health at all. Some people don't think they are. And the radio right. frequency radiation. You know, so, yeah. So there are two health issues there, and there was objection on both of those parts. People say, oh, you're, you know, there are some people that say you're nuts, you know. Mm -hmm. this is, I've had a cell phone for 15 years, and I don't feel anything. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> right. You know, so, you know, they're just... Anyway. And, and that's one of the things that we discovered in, in speaking to people is that, and I think this is going to be something that is going to make it difficult to challenge, is people don't want to hear that their cell phone might be an issue. Right. They, they, they glaze over. Yeah. They, don't, they are truly addicted to their cell phones. They don't want to hear it. Now, if you can talk to them about something that's not going to change their lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah, then yeah more, exactly. Yeah, and one of the ideas I had is, well, let's, let's approach people in terms of their smart meters where it doesn't change their lifestyle. You know, let's, let's talk yeah. about radiation that way. So, so, did, so did you get involved with the smart meters as well as the cell tower? Well, the thing about the smart meters is those came in after we had joined as a group, after we had had the town hall meeting, and two of our members became seriously ill from it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was another issue that, that complicated things in terms of our ability to, to work on these projects because it interfered with our health. Mm -hmm. um, but no, we, we never really did directly address that one. I Bill would like to. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, did all, we did all opt out. <laughs> so we don't have smart meters on our homes. Yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> our group did opt out, and we did get the uh, Take Back Your Power video, and we did try to distribute that um, widely. And we did speak with people one-on-one, -on -one, and mm -hmm. we continued to do that. Okay, good. But we only had enough energy. I mean, we barely, I mean, it was such a huge huge project that we never even dreamed it would t be so as many years as it's been so we thought well we'll take care of this first and then maybe we'll you know we'll that'll be our next project yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah get the smart meters taken out or something mm -hmm. yeah. right yeah in most places they have actual laws on the books that they don't want you to know about or at least utility policies that if you request the smart meter to be removed they have to do it yeah. Well, they may they dragged their feet for nine months before yeah. they took it off of mine, and and they put these things up when people weren't there. Most people didn't even know it had happened. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So after all the meetings, oh, I I forgot to ask you when you got the public records request finally filled, what was the interaction like that, or what did you find out about it between Verizon and the county officials? Well, we we filed more than one. We we had to file them a few a year. Okay. I don't think we found out much the first time. I can't remember it as being earth shaking in any way. Mm hmm. 
But it's in subsequent ones, it was eye-opening. They're very eye-opening. And in the last one, they dragged their feet until it was days before the hearing. I mean, we were having to go through hundreds of pages, and we'd been told by other activists that that this was sometimes kind of done so that you were overwhelmed with hundreds of pages to have to go through. Yeah. Yeah. So what did, give us some examples of what you found out that people may run into. Well, we found out that that there was all these behind the scenes shenanigans, at very much too coziness between Verizon and government officials, mm-hmm. and um, Verizon uh, in trying to influence the fire department. Um, things that we had suspected, but that we then had, you know, indication that it really had happened. And so we, we found, uh, you know, the Verizon guy gloating over being able to change the fire department's mind on, on going. I had gone to the fire department uh, head and, and talked to him about, you know, why don't we agree on an alternative location and you will just get it happening. You'll have your cell tower and, it, and it'll be in a better place than it is now for emergency purposes. And he actually he thought about it and, and but called the Verizon uh, hired gun to ask him about it, and then the hired gun talked him out of it. And, he, and the hired gun was was uh, just gloating over the fact that he was able to change this guy's mind, you well, know, with with one of the officials. Well, we don't know city. if he changed his mind. I mean, well, might, he did. oh yeah, maybe. But he to- he sort of instructed the guy to, you know, instructed the he sort of gave him guidance for what he should say and do and then he reported to all the the other county people that he had had that conversation and that the fire department had been contacted by Steve and that this was the tax that they were going to unified tax that they were going to yeah. take yeah mm-hmm. cuz i'm not so sure he he he, he was wanting gone. to go with us i think he wanted to be with Verizon yeah. well yeah, yeah. I mean, could, it could be, but at least he was willing to explore the idea. Yeah. So. Yeah. Or he said he was. He said he said he was. Well, he wouldn't even have bothered to call, uh, you know, uh, the guy. I don't think, or maybe he would have, you know. No, no, so no. you can see how we don't know. But those are the sort of things that we found. But here's a bigger thing. There, it, there. This is like one of those things about a dead end where, um, Allison was wondering about water sources and actually at our very first town hall meeting somebody asked is there a water source near where this tower will be placed on this um ultimately on the next location away from the from the post office was on a um another property mm-hmm. which a private property with a private property and then um so we kept you know researching and asking you know looking in county records asking people and and then it turned out that a, a, a local resident who works on the water line, that there was a water source very close to the access road that actually, you know, gave, it was, provided water for 60 households in the local school. And that it, all the equipment traveling on that access road could definitely, um, you know, affect and impact, negatively impact that water source. So the PRR came in really helpful there, too, because then when we saw how they were responding it, to it, it caused quite a flurry between the county and Verizon that they had to go back to their geologist, and then the geologist had to respond to the other geologist because they were, you know, following their protocol. They had to write all these reports, and, you know. Right. There wasn't an environmental impact report, but it, there was a thing called a negative declaration. declaration. And so, um, so when we received one of these, P, you know, stacks of papers from the PRR, obviously it had caused quite a bit of consternation. So then we knew that we had found something substantial that we should continue with. Okay. Okay. So in general, what was the attitude of the people at the county? I mean, those are supposed to be the public servants, right, working for the people that they're supposed to represent and supposed to put your interests above everybody else. What was the actual experience like working with those various people? Well, it's very interesting. You know, they, uh, they put on, they're politicians. <laughs> so, they, so they're able to present to the public a, a, a really kind of a good, their good side, like they're, they're on your side, but 
in the end, they don't, and it becomes it becomes apparent when they vote. <laughs> you, know? right, right. you make these excellent cases, and although they, and then they vote against it, you know, for uh, unknown reasons, really. Right. Uh, so, uh, well, we have a hunch what the reasons are, but uh, it, it's it's uh, the politicians always want it to appear to be very helpful, and so are nicey nice, and they're nicey nice back, and, mm-hmm. and you know, and so, uh, but eventually you find out the truth. Like we can't we can't go against Verizon because they they're too involved financially. But the comeback that they, that we really have to that is we invited Verizon to be there. If they never showed their face at that first public meeting. They would have found out a lot, you know, but they didn't want to be in a position to have to respond. They wanted somebody to respond, and then, you know, then they have yeah. the hired and, gun. And that's the other thing is is Verizon had invested nothing at the point of that meeting. They they had no money invested. And had they paid attention to our concerns, it, it, you know, this all could have been avoided. We could have been discussing an alternative site with them four years ago. Mm-hmm. And the tower could have been up long since. So that was unfortunate, but they're so arrogant that, you know, they won't even show up at a meeting. So you, sa- you said the county had reported that Verizon already had too much money in it, but you were saying that they really didn't when it started, right? It depends at what point, point in time. Right. So okay. not at that point. They hadn't invested anything in their you know, checking out sites and supposed money spent on that. Um, mm. But later, we were told that. I still don't think that they'd invested much of anything. <clears throat> but that's what we were told. And I think what what the underlying message was, you know, too much money comes into the county from Verizon. We can't go against them. So it's kind of an example of the county officials being impressed by and afraid of large, powerful corporate interests, right? Well, also, there's, we're still learning about the larger implications. Cause there's something called telecommunications, what's it called? There's these grid, you know, there's these whole governmental, you know, county. Um, there's, there's certain plans that we don't even know about where they have a, an agenda to set up these whole lines of telecommunications um, systems for... Um, um, we learned that from the PR. Oh, yeah, and we learned this from the PRR. Um, that's exactly true from the public records request, because the Verizon representative was proposing. He he was sort of saying that this is just a small example of what you can do. And I don't have my notes with me right in this moment, but um, there's these whole larger plans that all these different counties would be interconnected with these large telecommunication systems. And so it's not just money or Verizon. It's it's you know these different powers that be are unifying, but but it's and, and supposedly it's supposed to be for everybody's protection and, mm, and right. security and all that. But in the process, it seems that our our what we're all what our whole country is based upon is being left by the wayside, you know, because we were acting in good faith as as citizens, as concerned citizens, mm-hmm. wanting to participate in our local government and inform ourselves, but we were constantly kind of pushed back. And, and um, so it just, you know, it requires um, perseverance to keep um, exercising your rights as a, as a right. citizen. There's a couple of other things. We found out from reading the PRR that um, this person we've referred to as the hired gun was making presentations to county people, not just in the county we're in, but in surrounding counties, proposing that all of these counties would share the cost and benefit of these power placements and that costs would be reduced that way, but also that the public would be bypassed so that they didn't have to be bothering with Mm -hmm. all the things they were doing, having to do for us under the law. Mm -hmm. Mm. So that's kind of frightening. So they were using you as an example to teach other municipalities how to avoid dealing with the public officially. But But what I'm saying is that this proposal 
I think, pre-existed us. Yeah. And they were already mm. trying to bypass public input. Yeah. Right. Right. So, what what's the status now? What are the steps that we haven't covered that have happened? Well, we went, we did um, a presentation before the Planning Commission. Um, we did that twice. And, and the first time it was a tie. First so. time it was a tie. The next time it was voted against us. So then we appealed it, and we took that before the supervisors, and not surprisingly, um, they voted against us. And so now we're taking it before the CEQA court. With a, with a very fine lawyer. What, what, tell, tell us what, what kind of court that is. California Environmental Quality Act Court, which is a unique court strictly for those laws. Okay. That would only apply in California. Yeah. And, and it works in our particular case, but it might be some other issue that would work in somebody else's right. case. Okay. But it, you know, but then the, we were lucky. We found a lawyer that take what do they call it, takes it on contingency or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that, that the, who's, who's in violation there, the county or Verizon or both? Technically the county, because the county voted, and so it's the county that's going to have to support their case of how they voted. And how they violated the, Before that the court. Now, of course, behind the scenes, Verizon is paying the bills and providing yeah. the lawyers. That's part of the laws is if, if there's any legal issue, Verizon supplies the money. Oh, so, okay. So, it's, so even though we're suing the county, it's Verizon's money and lawyers that will be doing Yeah, this. and Verizon continued to be arrogant. We thought we finally would um, win our chance to sit down with Verizon and negotiate because we'd filed the suit because um, a mandatory settlement is required. But... Verizon chose not to show up. Hmm, interesting. So I'd like to make a, a brief point and, and just um, to show that no matter what entity it is, there are always some really honest and honorable people. And mm -hmm. um, we tried for years to meet in all forms. I mean, we, we just brainstormed any possible way and we to meet with Verizon representatives. And we have a list. We even, pre we even presented, Stephen presented that list to the county commissioners because this is another thing as, um, citizens should know. You have to put it in the record if you're dealing with a, count a county or um you know, entity. But we tried for years and years just to meet with Verizon and be part of the process. And, you know, right before our last hearing, um, we, we, the uh, local tribe, um, Gabrileno tribe, had joined with us in our efforts and really supported us, and we were actually working completely together with it. And they were able to arrange... They knew an archaeologist within Verizon, and she actually arranged for a meeting that happened, and Stephen and I were very fortunate to be invited by the tribe to attend that meeting, and um, we met at the actual site, proposed site, with the Verizon representative, the, archeo the archaeologist, the tribe, and who else? Well, it was just it was just the archaeologist oh, and, the and the hired gun. And oh, and the engineers, the engineers for Verizon, yeah. Randy. You know, oh, Randy yeah. was there. Yeah, yeah. and okay. and so. Um, no, that she works for Spectrum. Yeah, but Spectrum was the engineering company for Hire. Verizon. Right, but not Verizon. Right. right, but so anyway, but Mary. That anyway, the archaeologist worked for Verizon, and she she did arrange the meeting, and although it, you know. There was, you know, nothing substantial, no substantial change came from that. It was the first time that all parties were there and everybody spoke. And it, it um, the archaeologist also for the tribe was there. And um, I felt it was very meaningful because at least everybody spoke, you know, said what they had to say and spoke their point. And then finally it reached the point where... The Verizon representative actually said, well, we could put it in another location, but we'd have to put two towers, and we don't think the community would want that, and it would be too expensive. And the tribe 
the tribal representative said, well, that would be okay with us if it were in a safer location away from a place of cultural and ecological significance. And, um, and then, the, you know, it didn't go anywhere past that. Mm, okay. But, but at least this archaeologist did, you know, arrange that meeting. So I'm just saying, although it didn't change the outcome of where we are now, it happened. And yeah, it, it showed a good attitude. Right. It was close. It was very close to the last days. hearing. Yes, yeah, within days. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and but it also allowed us to show the the tribe and um, and to point out how close the water source was to mm-hmm. that road. Okay. So, are you waiting for another hearing now, or what's the current status with it? Um, for the county is supposed to. Um, provide our lawyer with their arguments today, and then our lawyer responds to the county on the 5th of September, mm-hmm. and then the oral, oral arguments go before the CEQA judge in September. Are, are, there may, are there definitely oral arguments? I mean, we're there, but I think yeah. it may be that it may be that uh, the judge makes a decision just based on the written arguments. He may not even uh, want oral arguments. He may have have his decision already made. No, that's a preliminary decision on his part. Oh, okay. They'll always have the argument. Yeah, yeah. they will, they all have the oral arguments. All right. All right. So, so what are you asking? What's your group asking for it, that you would get if you win? A safer location, but I think in order to, but I think at this point, because um, certain laws were not uh, followed, that they're going to have to do an environmental impact report at the very minimum. Okay, but you were saying that the attorney took it on contingency, which would mean that some kind of money award would happen too, that would pay the lawyer. Is that the case or not? Correct. Lawyer would be paid, right? Okay, okay. And I guess it, they, it would be a, a, a decision not to place it at this location, and that Verizon would have to start a new application somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. So, you sp- how many years have has your group spent on this project at this point? Four, four and a half. Four and a oh. half at this point. Wow. And there, how many of you have stayed in the group that whole time? All of us, except one. So how many people is that? Four? Our core group. Yeah, I'm just thinking of our core group. It's five. About six of us with with maybe seven of us. Not many. Not yeah, many, but a handful. It just takes a few dedicated people with, with persistence, and then the outsiders will happen once in a while to help you out. Right. When and they can. When they can, yeah. Okay, so, so give, you probably have a pretty good understanding of where things are moving you know, at, at least in this country, with the proliferation of cell towers, many of which are hidden and, ma- you know, um, camouflaged in church steeples and in the middle of kids' schools and stuff like that. How could the lessons that you've been through impact the future that everybody's being led to where there's just cell towers everywhere? I mean, well, I I'm sure you've thought that. about that on a bigger scale. Well, I, I think... The people have to come together, whether whether it starts with just a couple of people or not. And I think the most powerful people would be the parents of students in schools that have Wi-Fi in the schools. And mothers, just mothers in general, are protecting because it's you know, as you know, it's particularly dangerous for children. Well, yeah, I mean, you've get, you've gathered information beyond just cell towers. You're talking about Wi-Fi now, so why don't you let people know what you've found out about? Wi-Fi and why it might not be a, a great idea to pr- proceed like it's going. Well, once you start being electromagnetically sensitive, you're reacting to all of these things, and Wi-Fi is ubiquitous. It's like being in a wheelchair and not having ramps. I mean, it, it, it's a huge barrier to any public place, and we know that any form of of radiation is particularly harmful to children because um, their skull still is not formed fully yet and, um, you know, their brains are smaller and it, and it penetrates deeper. And so I think that the public is more likely to be open to protecting our children. Mm-hmm. We, there 
needs to be some inroad where we can get the public's attention because once you can get people to understand it on one level, eventually they'll transfer it. But starting with cell phones is a very hard sell. But one of the great spots, I think, to start is at the school. We were able to talk to the school about maintaining a wired connections yeah. and not using wireless yeah. at our local school, and they responded. Yeah. So mm. once you get that school to do that, well, that's, that's a process of education, too. And one of our members who is not always full-time with us because she had a daughter at the school, took that on as a special project and was very successful. And also one of our former members who was a father of a child at the school. They both put in a lot of time on that. So was that an elementary school? Yeah, K-8. Wow. Yeah, I, I noticed that, you know, just because I'm witnessing it close hand, that cell towers are being put right in the places where all the kids spend every day. And interestingly enough, they're also being put right in the middle of churches and uh, various religious organizations where people meet for, you know, Sunday school and other things like that. And the churches and the schools are accepting the money to do that, just like the cities are accepting money to change their policies. Right. And it sounds like a, lo a lot of it is about that. Mothers are a little different, though, uh, especially new ones, I think, before their kids get a cell phone in their hand, could be influenced in a powerful group. They're, you know, they're invested. Right, right. So maybe appealing to people's concern for the children is an easier place to start than their concern for themselves or the rest of the population at, in the beginning, anyway. That's, that's been our experience. Right. So, you know, one of the groups of people that I wanted to hear your explanations of all this is people living all over the country and even in other parts of the world because the installation of cell towers and smart meters is a global plan right now. And it's just getting ready to, um, to really ramp up. And, and I, I thought it would be encouraging to people in other communities to hear what you've done. And, and are you aware of the... Uh, new plans for the 5G network that's happening now? Yes, yeah. and, and, and we, we have been following that closely. Okay, yeah, I, I was just listening to the head of the FCC explaining to everybody that there's really no reason to question that it should go ahead. And just like the biotech industry tells you that if you're against GMOs, you're anti-science. And if you're against uh, cell towers on every corner, then, y you know, you're a similar... Uh, non-scientific type person but it sounds like the 5g network is going to be a lot more intense radiation than the ones that we're currently resisting so i agree with you. right but doing something about it is the same principles as, as what you've been acting on yeah and and there are other hopeful signs like when the the firemen the la rick firemen themselves um you know demonstrated against an, a, a certain kind of a cell tower installation at the fire department and the Board of Supervisors in Los Angeles backed them up. So there wow, are signs right. that, you know, people are thinking about this issue and, and that was, you know, we were very inspired by the Los Angeles um, County firemen who spoke up against yeah. the installation of these huge, powerful cell towers at their um, yeah. In fact, that's a, a really valuable clue for potential allies, I think, and besides just the general public or the people with the kids, is people within agencies that everybody looks up to, like fire departments. And yeah, and in other fact, ones. Allison has something right here to say about that as well, further. The firefighters, um, international. yeah, the International um, Association of Firefighters, um, did their own research, and they have an excellent document that you can find online. Okay. So how would people locate that and read it? Um, how did we find this? Let's see. You might just be able to Google LA, the title of the article. Mm, safety fact sheet. Um, yes, it's www.iaff.org. Mm-hmm. 
Is okay, the right the last no? the last continent consonants in that are a little bit hard to understand on the phone, so maybe you could give them with words to show which ones you're okay. saying. I is in Ivor, uh-huh. A is in Alice, F is in Frank, F is in Frank dot org. Okay. Okay. And it's International Association of Firefighters Division of Occupational Health, Safety, and Medicine. Okay. Okay. Great. And and how do they find? I guess they just look up that group and then look for papers that they've put out. I think I think it should be there. It's um, there. It's quite extensive and and it's excellent. Okay. Okay. Great. It's yeah. under the it's under the tab of health, safety, and medicine. Okay, excellent. Yeah, that that's a really good idea. Anything that can be inspiring for local groups to try to keep, you know, the degree of oversaturation with Wi-Fi under control would be great. Um, I've been talking to people lately, some of the hypersensitive people, that maybe more, you know, will join them later on after more exposure. But some of these people are actually every day in intense pain just by being around these things. And financially, they can't move away right away. So it it uh, becomes a high priority for more and more of those people. Unfortunately, a lot of these people, until it gets really bad, are not aware of what it's causing it. No. So they might know they don't feel well, but they don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They They take so much time to build up the symptoms gradually, and there's so many variables involved. It's really hard to pin it down to specific causes. Yeah. But uh, the movie that you mentioned before, Take Back Your Power, I think one of you mentioned that. Um, it shows even insects being immediately affected by uh, the radiation coming out of smart meters, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, I guess in in summary, if you wanted to give advice to people that, oh, I before, <laughs> I'm jumping around too much, but I, I forgot to ask you before we get to that summary point. How did you find out that there was a plan to put a cell tower right there? Oh, because years ago the fire department had requested it, and they, and nothing came of it. None of the um, tower companies were interested because the population up here is really small. I think they thought that the financial rewards were just not going to be worth it. Okay. Um, and then when we had a change in supervisors. Um, the fire department approached town hall and requested that they submit that request again. And, and this time, um, the current supervisor was um, open to that and contacted companies to try to persuade them to, uh, to make that happen. And that's, that's how that came about. Okay, and then you, ju- you just happened to hear about it through a town meeting or something? That that was going on? I, yeah, the you know, the, well, the, because the proposal was to be at the fire department, and I'm in the HOA that that okay. is in, then the Homeowners Association sent out letters to everybody in the association. Oh, I see, okay. And that's how I knew about it, and that's why I was showing up at HOA meetings and town hall meetings. All right. Now, what about, what would you suggest, if anything, to people, and they are becoming aware of this issue, they watch some of these videos or look at some of the websites that we're talking about, look at YouTube videos about education on the dangers of Wi-Fi, and they start being aware that it is important, especially to their kids, and then they look around, they find one of these sites that has maps on it that actually says where the local cell towers right now are sitting and operating. And they realize that their town is full of these things. Do you feel like there's going to be a chance to get any of those removed or moved somewhere safer? That has happened, but that's that's really unusual. It's it's much more effective to get a group together right away when you hear that one is going to go in, mm-hmm. because very often you'll you'll get just a, like a couple of paragraphs in a newspaper saying that this tower was suggested and then um, the company decided it was an unsuitable location. I think the translation it is that they got pushed back early and so decided not to pursue it. Okay. 
And what about if you're sending your kids to school and you find out that there's a cell tower right in the middle of it? Well, then I would, well, if it was my child, I would move them. Okay. Um, But short of that, I would start talking to other parents and get parents to come together um, to the school board and bring up their concerns. Some of those towers have been removed. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I guess a similar principle would apply if you find out that a place you're going for religious meetings every weekend or whenever you're going there has a cell tower, you know, concealed in the architecture somewhere which is mm-hmm. common. Well, it is, and, and, that, and that's a sad situation because, they're, because schools and churches are kind of vulnerable to needing money. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so these things go up and people don't even notice, about, notice because they are concealed. Right, so if somebody brings it up, I'm sure they're not going to be necessarily very much appreciated, but... Um, I guess the only, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but it seems like one of the things you could do if it's your church or temple or some organization where you're meeting and the kids are having their, um, you know, school meetings and things like that, that uh, maybe you could propose that the people get together and try to pay some amount to offset what the, the organization would be receiving every month from the cell tower company. And it's interesting that you should that say out. that because that's one, that's the first thing we tried was to brainstorm a way that the um, landowner yeah. up here <laughs> could could have money coming in and not have it be the cell tower. But that's one of the first thoughts we had, and I I think particularly with the church that that could be very possible. Right. I mean, I mean, in a way, this is a financial question because. Most of these things are being accepted because the church or the school or the city or whatever it is starts getting a monthly income that doesn't take them any work. Exactly. And has no cost, except for their lives. But other than that, no cost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, think that, I think that kind of thinking is, is a good plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's, it's similar to, we've had people on the show a lot about aspects of Agenda 21 in, in its newest forms, which is really being pushed out worldwide, but especially in the U.S., and cities are giving into it without really being clear what they're doing by taking grant, so-called grants, and the grants have long contracts that go with them, but just like nobody reads the uh, fine print on your agreement for your web browser or things like that. Uh, I don't think most of the city people who vote for the money are even aware of what all the conditions to it are. I'm sure you're right. Right. So, okay, now I think I'm safe to ask you, you know, what maybe each of you would like to share that you've learned from this whole experience to people that are just finding out about the issue and are kind of overwhelmed with it and feeling like there's nothing they, they can do because the other side is so organized and so powerful against them. Um, Have you ended up with some hopeful feeling about that or or feeling beaten down or, you know, where are you with the whole thing right now? We do go through periods of feeling beaten down and discouraged and I, I think a group needs to understand that you can't depend on your emotional reactions, um, that you have to work through those because you're going to have ups and downs and it, it isn't always a jolly struggle, um, but it's well worth it. And, and to hang in there and not get discouraged, I think that it's really important that the word get out and that people become aware. Eventually, there'll be a tipping point where those towers are going to come down. Mm-hmm. They have and when you have a, a group of dedicated people, they'll, they'll hang in there, even through the bad spots. And sometimes there'll be a guy like me that's optimistic, even <laughs> when it's looking bad. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think we're in a good position to win. But uh, uh, they, they say that I'm counting my chickens before they hatch. But I'm, I'm out there counting them. I think we're going to win. Well, sometimes, <laughs> in certain ways, counting your chickens before they hatch is also called vision. That's right. <laughs> Actually, we all feel optimistic that we're going to win this. But what I, but my message is that 
you can't count on that those good feelings to get you through you've got to keep slogging no matter what your emotion is at the moment yeah yeah and, and i would say networking with anyone and everyone that has any connection because we networked with activists there were there was a group in a place called Crowley Lake and they actually stopped or relocated a cell tower in their town and that gave us a boost to know that it was possible. We we talked with different biologists, um, the the tribal members, um, you know, talking with other people who are involved in, in any form of what we were researching at the time. People were so helpful and sharing information and going out of their way to to help us. It made all the difference and mm-hmm. I would say besides our hard hard work and hanging in there when we weren't sure if we would make it. Yeah. Do you think you're gonna keep your group together and, and have another focus once this one gets completed? I'd like to. I'd like to pursue the smart meters. Yeah, that would be good. We've lost one of our our a, a, a very key person passed away recently that was in our group, and, and, and that's going to be, that person was irreplaceable, but um, mm. we'll see what happens. Yeah, you may find out somebody else great is ready to start, you know, join you. That's true, that's yeah. true. And there are, there are larger level um, things going on, too, like you might get, you know, support from people like uh, Take Back Your Power, their organization. Especially if you get into smart meter involvement. Well, we did reach out to quite a few organizations. Um, but in, in, in talking about this today, speaking of support from unknown areas, mm-hmm. uh, looking back, it, it felt like a struggle all the way, but looking back, we felt like it was somewhat magical that there might be support from, from a different level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Know? Right, right. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, this was a very unusual group, um, or at least I felt like it was I unusual. I agree, I agree. And we had what we called the group mind because we all had different strengths and 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 so, and some, you know, where one of us would falter, somebody else would come in strongly, and sometimes there was just, you know, we can't really explain it, but it, yeah. was, it was beautiful um, synergy of of people's energies. It's really symbolic, you know, because I, I know from in what they teach in business school now is that whatever you can get away with and make a profit, even if it's illegal, if the fine you have to pay is less than the profit, that's good business. Oh, wow. and, they're, and they're literally teaching this all across the country now. Really? You see and, somebody actually saying that in a uh, classroom? Um, uh, not, in, in slightly different words, yes. <laughs> and and, uh, and and not just in one classroom, it's universal. And oh, wow. it's really amazing what's being taught. And that's one paradigm of thought where the, the morality is what ma- whatever makes the most money and, and power it is self-evidently the best thing. And the other mentality is even if you don't get a lot of satisfaction or completion in it right away, you just have to do what is ethically right to help other people, no matter what happens. And yeah. um, I'd like to see that paradigm get more popular. Because I think yeah. it, w- it would translate into not just getting rid of smart meters, but so many things have come from the other way of thinking that would have to disappear. If be people true. looked be at it. Right. something better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it doesn't mean that we would have no technology. It just means the technology could actually be designed in a way that was really good for people. Oh, it always could have. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm trying to go for the cheapest, it may not. <laughs> well, you know, there, there are energy sources that we're not, it, it's totally forbidden to talk about, but they're available now, and they're not just clean. They're totally, many of them are totally free. You know, running cars on water and things like that have been totally proven. There's no question. But the problem is not that you need government grants and more research and any of that nonsense, but you need the authorities to stop killing the inventors. And as, as soon as that happens, then things will radically change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it seems like more education is a step toward that. Yeah. So, you know, you guys are doing something really great that could have a lot of unseen support that's about to emerge from places we don't even know yet. 
Yes. That's the so. hope, and it feels like that should happen. Right. Yeah, I think so. Well, it will happen. It's just a matter of when. We're trying to make it happen sooner. Yes. And we want to encourage other people to step up, you know, step up and keep it going. You know? Yeah, I mean, everybody's got these incredible, brilliant, creative, heroic abilities hidden inside them, and, and one of the main points of the power structures that, and the educational system is that we should never figure that out. But I think if there's a certain critical small number that start becoming self-aware, like they said of the computers in the Terminator movies, then the whole thing could, you know, change very quickly in a good direction. Well, we know that it takes a small percentage to to create change. So right. that's why that one-on-one matters. It it it, yeah. it may seem overwhelming, but you don't need to get to everybody. No, not at all. It's only a few percent that started the whole country. Yeah. So, you know, with the idea of individual freedom and respecting everybody else's freedom, and that was basically all the law there was, and it was considered enough at that time. Okay. So, anyway, I hope that you you guys will let us know what happens when, when the decision comes and what your group ends up doing after that. It would be oh, fun to right. kind of stay in touch if you want to. I would like to. And uh, do you want to mention a website? Do you want people to go to your website? Oh. Yeah. Yes, please, because we have set that website up as an educational device. We're posting um, the hearings. We only have the first hearing on there right now. Mm-hmm. But I want, what I want people to know is that it doesn't matter your background or your education. One of the presenters was, how old was she at the time, nine? Oh, yeah. And you know, she was I mean, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to have some special background. You can be really nervous and it could be obvious. It doesn't yeah, matter. So um, eventually we'll get all of the hearings up there. Um, when we have the decisions, you know, we'll, we'll post those too. But at least the first set of hearings is up there. Okay. It also talks about cell phones and I think maybe even smart meters. I'm not sure. Um, but there's quite a bit of material on there. And it's www.keepbaldywild. Baldy is B-A-L-D-Y. Dot com. Okay, keep like K E E P B A L D Y wild, wild dot com, right? Right. Okay, great. And we encourage people to visit that site. Okay, can, if they had a question for any of you, can they get questions answered that way if they write to you? Yes, if they write through that site, I will I will receive them. Okay, yeah, that would be great. All right, well, thanks for staying extra time with us. I really appreciate it, and um, hopefully we'll drum up some support from anywhere else in the world that may listen to this uh, discussion because you guys need to have support of everybody as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Richard. So, thanks right. for this Thank opportunity you. and good luck with your efforts on the radio station. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Stephen. We'll talk to all, all you guys pretty soon. Hold on and we'll say goodbye in the break here. Okay, so that was three of our very inspiring friends from Keep Baldy Wild and their website keepbaldywild.com um, go there and see what they're doing and the whole point of it is to, to try to have examples and other people get uh, energized to do similar things in their own communities and I don't know what the extent of what our possible accomplish- accomplishments might be at this point but we're not going to find out unless we try and these global corporations um, they need some redirection by all of us because they have no ethics, most of them at all. In fact, I, in the MBA program that I was in, uh, they were actually teaching, um, and this has come up recently in several discussions, they were teaching that if you can get away with something, even if it's illegal, even if they, as long as the penalty that you pay for it is less, oh, I was talking to Dr. Cousins about it, that's right, even if the penalty for it is less than um, what the profit that you make that it's still good business and you're very brilliant and, and uh, shrewd business person to do it and that seems to be the um, what would you call it the new morality of the global corporations and of course the people above the global corporations that rule them they're on a whole different level they're not there to make money at our expense they're there to wipe us out gradually systematically ritualistically and in ways that most normal people would not relate to. But but on the global corporation level, it is something that 
people can stand up against and actually not be defeated. So I am very thankful for the work of Keep Baldy Wild and other groups like that that are doing the best that they can with the time and resources that they have as, as little as they may be. So at the top level, you know, of the power structure, they're totally confident that they can finish us off and destroy us, and they're doing it, and they think all bases are covered. But there are some bases that they haven't covered. And um, at, the, at the very top level, the, the few that are controlling the whole system, they know there are levels of power that they can't access. And there, this is not known to the most of the power structure, but there are power levels that have fail-safe mechanisms built in, and it has to do with consciousness, and nobody of malicious intent can access them. And they know that normal people out in the population like us, many of us are not malicious. We just want everybody to be okay. And there are things that we can get to in, inside of ourselves, levels of awareness that turn into healing power that is real and practical on the physical level. Most people don't believe that this is possible, but it really is. And if we can get there, even a small, significant handful of us can get there. If we become self-aware enough to do that, then the whole game changes radically. And I, I do a terrible job of trying to explain this, but it, I keep trying over and over again because I feel like I have a responsibility because I know something about this that I have to share it with you. And hopefully I'll get better at, at explaining it, but that's what Lost Arts Radio is really about and Lost Arts Research Institute. Yeah, it's about health, but health, only part of health is to get rid of all of your health concerns like degenerative disease, uh, susceptibility to infection, and, you know, we need to build our immunity up because of what the rulers around us are doing to our environment to keep our sanity and our clarity as long as possible and our energy and not have to go through the degeneration they want us to think is normal. But that's not the whole ultimate reason for it. It starts with harmonizing your lifestyle with the laws of nature, even though we've gotten so far out of touch with those. And we need to make the subconscious conscious, and that is not impossible, contrary to popular opinion. Fear, we need to get out of that, because fear blocks your clarity completely. And, again, contrary to popular belief, fear is optional. And it's not something you get rid of by gritting your teeth and setting your you know, willpower against it. That does not work. You can, you can control your actions that way, but the fear remains. And so there's a level of relaxation where the fear falls away. And it doesn't impede your action. In fact, it makes it much more powerful and uh, much more unstoppable if you can get away from fear, and you can. So you need to, I have to be quick here because we're just about out of time, but you need to re retune your, tr your receiver, which all of us are receivers and transmitters, and pick up a different energy stream, which is always available, and also retune, retune the transmitter part where you're sending out energy to the rest of actually all creation, but certainly all the world and other people, and they don't have to know about it consciously. These are the subtle avenues of turning things around that many of us are completely unaware of, but they're the most powerful of anything I know. And so if I ever figure out better ways to convey it to you or, or share inspiration ideas in that direction, I want to do that. And um, so, you know, if a few people ever get that, doesn't matter if it's me or you or anybody in particular, but a few of us, a critical mass, which is not very big, the whole thing can be turned around. And I, I really still have the feeling like that could happen because we're being helped from levels we don't see all the time, all the time. And it's just whether we're tuned into it or not. So I would recommend in the last few seconds we have here to like, you know how you, when you're standing in a dark room, absolutely pitch dark, and, and you can feel if somebody's standing next to you, 
even if you can't see them. That I don't know what name to put on that. You could talk, call it a dark room sense, something like that. Almost everybody is aware of that. If you use that and start scanning in that room you're in, because remember, it is pitch dark. All you're seeing is the physical sense vi uh, frequencies, which is almost nothing compared to all that is. And there are benevolent, incredibly beyond friendly influences with you all, all the time. I'm absolutely sure of that because of experience. And you can scan for them. And if you pick them up in your scanning and lock onto their, their feeling next to you, it can be the beginning of changing absolutely everything. So anyway, um, thanks to Doug Diamond, uh, diamonddiscaudio.com, and all of you, because you're the reason that we're here. Um, go to the website if you have a chance, lostartsradio.com. If you happen to have resources and you want to help us donate to keeping us on the air because that's critically needed, have a great week. Practice the stuff we talked about. Um, do everything good that you can do. And come and see us next Saturday morning for the live call-in show, 8 o'clock in the morning Pacific, 11 o'clock Eastern. And uh, we'll talk to you then. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Lost Arts Radio. Visit our website at lostartsradio.com for Richard's weekly focus articles, as well as lots of other really great free educational resources. We also have links to all of the great independent musicians whose music we feature each week on Lost Arts Radio. And if you like Lost Arts Radio, please consider donating a few bucks or leave us a tip to help keep us on the air. We spend many, many hours each week to bring you the best show we can with the best guests around. You can find our donate button on our website at lostartsradio.com. See how words can twist and hand
friends can bring light bulbs inside empty homes when nobody's there to hear. Can't really just open me wide.